are back for the evening session. I don't believe we need to take roll call because we just recessed. So we are on to item 3.9. Ordinance, ordinance regulating, regulating foreign influence in city, city elections. elections. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I missed, missed 3.8. Apologies. I don't know why I crossed that one off. Sorry. 
Sorry, Roberto. Oh, I'm so sorry. Come on down. Okay, item 3.8, status report on policies adopted by retirement boards. And uh, Roberto, I didn't have a note about a presentation. Did you want to say a few words? I, I don't have any prepared comments, but you did scare me there when you skipped the item. Uh, so, I'm so sorry. I'm I questions. apologize. Uh, the only comment I can make is uh, we hope the memo is, uh, is self-explanatory, but I'm happy to address any questions you may have. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, thank you for being here. And yes, yeah, sorry for skipping ahead. Let's go to public comment first. Do we have any public comment on item 3.8? We're just double checking just to be super sure. One second. Uh, we have one hand raised, Paul. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, please uh, afford me just a moment so I can pull up the agenda so I stay on topic and the mayor does not check me, which I know he will if I get off. Uh, 3.8, status report retirement, board administration for retirement services, office of retirement. Retirement is going to be uh, an issue that is going to absorb a large amount of the general fund. And we have to accept it. Sorry, Paul, you're, bre it's you're it's breaking up. Cool. We're having a hard time hearing you. Okay, well, I would ask that a certain amount of courtesy, uh, as I've stated here, without the the entire team. Can you hear me now? I believe so. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the general fund that retirement benefits will take up, why? Because we have the baby boomer generation moving out and they are living longer. So what that means is healthcare and the portion of their OLA, you know, cost of living adjustment is built into their retirement benefit. And of course, this is just for public service. You know, I thought they, this was a, this was something that they did out of the goodness and kindness of their heart that they wanted to be public servants and serve the needs of the public. Nah, Charlie, you wanted the benefits, man. So we're gonna give them to you. However, there needs to be an accounting for it now so that in the future, future councils are not... Brian Darby. Hi, um, sort of reiterating what the other gentlemen were saying. And I, I would really, you ladies and gentlemen are very, everybody on the council is very smart and the staff is very smart. Some kind of symposium or some kind of big meeting to find long-term solutions for retirement obligations, re municipalities. I know a lot of other cities. I wish they had the talent that this city does. And it would be just a, wouldn't that be a way maybe like by the end of next year, we actually have an answer for this. I mean, that would be worth at least a pizza for everybody. So I, I just want to encourage, I hate to say the phrase, think outside the box. Think outside the universe. We, we need some real solutions so other cities don't struggle with this and that people who've worked tirelessly and respectfully have the retirement and the protections they have. And we do want people to live, live longer. That, it, it's just part of the gifts that modern society has granted us. Thank you. Back to council. Great, thank you. So, uh, Roberto, again, appreciate you being here, and I appreciated the response to our letter and the memo from both of the chairs. I did just want to highlight, so for those of you who've been looking at the item, so Exhibit A 
is where we have policies that have been reviewed and are in alignment, and then Exhibit B, they're still being reviewed, and there's still quite a bit under that, and I understand there's a lot of work there. I guess I just wanted to make a comment and ask a question. The comment would be, I, I would have real concern looking at this list if things like hiring policies, vaccine uh, program, uh, or vaccination mandate, employee travel, procurement, uh, really any of these, there was some disagreement or misalignment, I'd have concerns and really want to understand why, and is it justified and what's the rationale. And so my, my hope and expectation will be once you all review all of these that we find that in fact city policies are well thought out, make sense, have served us well, have stood the test of time, and apply equally to ORS. Um, I guess as you come back, this gets to my question, we will understand for any that you think are not aligned why, and we can have that conversation then. I'm hoping there aren't any. Uh, I did not, I could not tell from the letter when you plan to come back having reviewed everything in Exhibit B, and I don't, I don't know if you're able to answer that now, but. I, I'm not able to answer that right now. We will try to come back as quickly as possible. Um, and to your comment, you are correct. Uh, we intend to, uh, whenever we find this uh, discrepancy or difference between a, a city policy and some other procedure we'd like to pursue, we will explain the rationale behind it, obviously. And you know, when we come back before it, you, the council, obviously, we can have that discussion. Okay. I want to hear from any colleagues who want to chime in before suggesting a motion, but I'll, I'll go ahead and just ask you, do, do you have a sense from, for the policies under Exhibit B, which appear to be about half of the, it looks like you've gotten through half or more and there's still about half to go, uh, maybe a little less, what, what would be a reasonable time frame roughly? Give us a ballpark. It's hard to say. I don't want to commit myself to 90 days, but we're hoping sometime in the spring. Certainly, we're hoping within the first half of the 2024 year to be back before you. Okay. Um, I think the sooner we can get clarity, the better, given that there's a lot that we're discussing under here. Um, let, me, let me turn to my colleagues here. Councilor Davis, do you want to chime in? Yes, thank you. Um, and, and thank you, Roberto, for being here this evening. Um, the, I, I have the same concerns as the mayor about the extent of Exhibit B. Um, in the memo, it talks about um, the determining whether these policies adequately address the particular requirements and risks associated with the independent administration of the plans and things like um, cash overages and shortages, uh, general guidelines for cash handling procedures. Am I assuming correctly when I read that along with the statement about particular requirements and risks that your policies may go beyond what the city is as opposed to being, being somehow different in a more lenient way? Is that what, what that's trying to say there? No, no, not at all. Uh, so a couple of things. The first one is the fact that the boards are still reviewing the, these policies. It just means that it's open for us to do further review because there might be some, um, I think for the most part, we're in agreement with the bulk of those policies, but there might be some specific issues that we want to get a chance to really review. I would think that in most cases, Casamari Davis, uh, we may come back with a more stringent requirement, but that's, that's not to say that that will be in every case. I think there could be other situations where it won't be either a more relaxed or a stringent, a stringent uh, control, but it would just be a different kind of approach. So we would like to get a chance to, especially at, as it relates to uh, cash-related issues because of our money managers and everything else that we want to make sure that um, they actually allow us to, uh, to continue doing the business as, as we have done in the past. And again, it's not a matter of being more stringent or not, but that it meets the controls that are required, but at the same time allowing us to be efficient in the operations at the office. Understood. I, um, I definitely want efficiency. Um, I would really caution you and the boards to uh, really look at 
hiring policy, discipline policy, um, probationary periods, management performance program, those kinds of things being in line with, with the city. And if they are not in line with the city, really being very explicit about how, the, why not? Um, because I don't, it, it's just not really, I, I'm, ve I'm very worried about our, I know the boards have fiduciary responsibility, but we're the plan sponsor, and, and those kinds of things may, might open us up um, to legal issues, and I, I have big concerns about that because your employees are city employees. Um, so all of these employment ones are very, very concerning to me that they're on this list. I did want to ask as well, um, it said in the memo that there, the governance committees were going to be jointly meeting with Cortex on November 27th. Can you tell us a little bit about, that was a couple of weeks ago already, can you tell us about that meeting? Yes, so um, what that refers to is, as you saw in the memo there, Exhibit A and B, and so there's a work plan in concept on how to move forward with, with Exhibit B, those policies that we still need to review. And so what the committee did was they adopted that work plan in concept, and then that work plan is going to be approved by the boards at the meetings in December. It was already approved by the Police and Fire Board at the meeting last week, and it's expected that it will be approved. It will be discussed at the meeting for further later next week, and it's expected that it will be approved. And once that takes place, then after the new year, staff and general counsel and Cortex start kicking off the review uh, so we can make recommendations, com recommendations to the governance committee. That's, that's the goal, so that eventually the committee have um, chances to review uh, the recommendations and then adopt whatever recommendations are, are being made and then bring those back to the board for further discussion and final approval before we come back before you counsel with the uh, final um, recommendations. But I, I, I think your point is well taken, uh, Councilmember Davis. I, I just want to make the point here that the fact that we're reviewing so many of them does not mean that we're not, we're not in agreement with probably 95% of the detail on those policies is that we may have found a couple of issues here and there that we want to get a chance to review further. But even uh, in your example, even those that are included in XBB, it does not mean that um, the boards disagree in concept with the bulk of it. We, in fact, agree with most of it, but there might be a couple of issues that we want to get a chance to uh, discuss fully before we determine, hey, are we going to adopt it completely as a whole, or are we going to make some recommendations? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. I'd like to just request um, that the Office of Employee Relations and and the city attorney review any anything before it comes to us at the council um, that comes out of th those discussions and recommendations um, from the boards. Uh, with that, I'll uh, move acceptance of the status report. Second. Okay, thank you. We have a motion and a second. Did council member Foley have her hand up? Yes, I Yes, I do. Go ahead, council member. Thank you, uh, Roberto. Thank you for being here. I, I share the concerns of the mayor and councilman Davis. I appreciate the list that you have, uh, that you're, uh, are modifying to conform to city policy, but the ones that are still outstanding, there's quite a number of them. Uh, and I'll just to highlight a few that are still of concern to me. Uh, and Councilmember Davis already mentioned some of them, but employee travel, for example, employee labor relations, hiring, employment classification, performance assessment, uh, purchasing and procurement, transfer of surplus property loans. Um, so my question is, you, you said you might come back in the first half of the uh, next year. But I'm curious what steps you need to go through to come back to us so I can understand why the timing is so long. Yes, no, fair question. So, um, so we're going to kick it off in January. Uh, there's going to be work related to staff and general counsel and cortex. So that may take a little work before we can go to the governance committee. And then the governance committee may 
I, I doubt that this is going to be discussion that is going to be approved in just one governance committee. So that will probably take us to February. And then from there, once the governance committee adopt whatever recommendations may be put forward, they need to go back to the boards. So that will take us to March, most likely. And this is assuming that, as you know, you both work in, obviously, Councilmember Davis is the council liaison for federating and you are for police and fire. Assuming that both boards actually agree with the governance committees, right? Because sometimes the boards have difference of opinion among themselves. So assuming they both agree, then we should be able to be ready to come back uh, before your council uh, sometime late March or sometime in April. But again, I, I don't want to commit myself to that timeline uh, because I think this, this review that I'm referring to assumes that um, once we have recommendations, we as in staff and Cortex and the general counsel to the committees and the boards, that these recommendations uh, will not only be discussed, but they will be accepted. If there's any kind of further review that is required by then, then that will, could actually extend the review process. So that's what I'm thinking at the very least, or at the very late, sometime uh, in the first half of the, of the 2024 calendar year. But that's conceptually, that is uh, what I'm envisioning the process to look like. Okay, thank you. That actually, that's really helpful to understand that you have to go to the joint boards. That we we've talked uh, uh, before in in previous council meetings or joint meetings of unifying and having one board between the for the retirement system. And this makes one good reason why you should do it. Then you don't have to go back and forth between federated and police and fire. I'm not advocating for that. I'm just saying from a timing standpoint, it would be me uh, quicker. But I, I understand that you're going through the process and why it's taking a little bit longer. And I, I appreciate the explanation. Um, of course, the sooner the better, because there's a lot of the issues that concern me in particular are the employment issues, because the, your employees are actually our employees and we could be at some risk if that's not handled properly. So I just want to make sure that we're all in alignment in our duties and knowing that you are an independent uh, body and your trustees have fiduciary responsibility. Uh, we are the plan sponsor, as Council Member Davis said, and we have the ultimate liability should there any be any risk that, that occur or any liability. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. And thank you for this update. It, it's very helpful. You're welcome. Great. Thanks, Councilor Foley. Thank you again for the update, Roberto. Appreciate you being here in person. Uh, I do not see any other hands. Tony, let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Torres? Yes. Cohen? <coughs> Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? Yes. Dwan? Yes. Candelas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Batra? Yes. Kame? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. All right, now we're on to item 3.9, proposed ordinance regulating foreign influence in city elections. Don't believe there's a staff presentation, but we I'll do I'll move have, approval. Okay, we do have staff Second. here to answer questions if we have them. We do have a motion now, but let's go to public comment. Okay, I have four hands so far. Paul followed by Waskar. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. The lack of city analysis of the influence of foreign money inside of my city elections is glaring and unacceptable. You should never come to this table and sit there with a straight face and answer to me. You're not answering to the council. They are represent. They are represent. Representation and a representation of the public. So you actually answer to me, not the council. And you have nothing to say about foreign influence. And what I want to talk about is China, Hong Kong, India, Indonesia, the Bank of London. These cities have investments in real estate downtown. 
Don't lie to me. Ask Chris Burton. Just ask Chris Burton how much money, foreign money, especially from Lloyd's of London, he should be very familiar with that one. Deutsche Bank, investing in real estate downtown. And also Canada, do you, you at least 20% of downtown real estate, Canada has their retirement fund invested in downtown properties. So it's disgusting to me as an informed citizen that you come to this table and have absolutely nothing to say about that kind of foreign influence in my city. So I'm really curious and I'm gonna sit here and wait and listen to your lame answers. Oscar followed by Brian. Good evening, Council. Oscar Castro, Working Partnerships. Uh, on behalf of Working Partnerships USA, I would like to encourage the City Council to support the memo from Council Members Cohen, Jimenez, Foley, Candelas, and Vice Mayor Kamei to pass a strong common sense policy to and ensure foreign influence corporations cannot pass election money through the subsidiaries, other PACs, as loopholes. We'd like to thank the City Attorney's Office for their work on the original draft ordinance to thank Council Members Cohen and Jimenez for their continued leadership on campaign finance issues. Maintaining a strong democracy here in the city of San Jose requires doing everything we can to ensure our, elected, our elections are a time for the people of San Jose to have their voices heard, not just wealthy special interests and especially not wealthy foreign investors and the corporations they influence. We know that the teacher in Ellen Rock, the firefighter in Cambrian, a bar owner on Post Street, or a retired homeowner in Willow Glen may have very different interests when it comes to civil rights, public safety, housing, land use, and taxation than a foreign sovereign wealth fund, a Saudi Arabian state-owned enterprise, or their US-based corporate holdings. So why do we allow foreign influence corporations to continue to spend tens of thousands of dollars in San Jose on elections every two years? When PACs like the California Apartment Association bundle funds from foreign influence corporations, like Essex and Equity Residential and companies like Boston Properties or Lyft give to candidates or PACs, uh, they may not be directly responding to a specific request from a foreign investor, but they are continuing to give them a voice in our elections, a voice that can include unlimited spending currently. This is why the alternative ordinance is a bad policy. The issue isn't whether those businesses are getting a specific direction from foreign entities. It's that by their very nature, they are required to act in the interest of these foreign investors. Please pass the Cohen, Jimenez, Foley, Kame, Candelas memo to ensure a strong policy and to close the loopholes to further. Brian, followed by Joe. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I, I would hope for a higher calling eventually that all local, county, Sorry, state and federal elections um, don't allow any money that there's a certain amount given to each person. Because let's face it, we're all people. And you uh, individual, you find folks on the council have money thrown at you. you. You know, you can't go there every penny and you're just at the local level. I can't imagine what a, what a uh, presidential candidate has to put up with, you know, and I don't feel for them too much, but um, any ordinance that can help stop influence peddling of any kind in elections, because elections are the backbone of what a democracy is, or, or public, however you look at it, um, and having fair elections, which I think we really try hard. I know Santa Clara and San Jose do. It, 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 it's obvious in the follow-ups, you know, with letters and stuff you get from the Santa Clara people who run the elections. I would encourage San Jose to be the the tip of the spear and find a way to fund elections where nobody can give any money. You know, you carry signs, you go out and placard, and you know what, I have a novel idea where we go out and talk to each other. <laughs> Anyways, that's my great hope. Thank you. Joe followed by Roma. This is Joe Nguyen, field representative for assembly member Alex Lee, and I'm here today to talk, to speak on behalf of the assembly member. Thank you to the council for taking up this important issue of closing the loophole in campaign finance law. 
Currently, foreign companies cannot spend or contribute money on U.S. elections, but businesses that are nominally U.S.-based may have significant foreign ownership who in turn have the ability to influence political contributions. This loophole undermines how campaigns are financed. The proposed city measure aligns with Assemblymember Lee's authored bill AB83 in the state legislature, which we are working hard to move forward in 2024. I would like to express Assemblymember Lee's support for this city measure. Thank you, Council, for considering the measure, and thank you, Councilmember Cohen, for championing this item. Thank you. Roma? Thank you. This is Roma Dawson speaking as an individual, not as a member of HCBC. And I just had to take a moment to thank council members Cohen, Jimenez, Foley, and Candelas for, and most especially, last but not least, my own council member, the vice mayor, for putting out a thoughtful, detailed memo and for hanging in there for several years now. You know, I have the great privilege of helping Mayor Susan Hammer get elected. I was the number two person on her campaign responsible for helping her raise over a million dollars to sit in that seat for eight years. And I'll never forget the pain that that was. And uh, this doesn't fix everything, but you have the satisfaction of knowing you've done what you can to protect our citizens here in San Jose. Thank you so very much. Back to council. Great, thank you. Okay, coming back to the council, Councilor Jimenez, would you just clarify your motion, please? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was a little excited were, to get the I meeting moving that I didn't, yeah. uh, I, anyway, so, th so there's a memo uh, dated, uh, well, today's date, uh, uh, myself, uh, Council Member Cohen, Council Member Foley, Council Member Candelas, and Vice Mayor Kame that signed on, uh, essentially just uh, moving forward a recommendation, specifically a, um, in the city attorney's memo, uh, replacement memo dated 1130. Um, so that is in fact the motion. Um, so I would assume the seconder probably still. Wonderful, yeah, so, so I apologize for that. Okay. Uh, I did wanna say just a few things um, for, you know, we often touch on items that have been around a little while. <laughs> and this item has been around a little while. I actually pulled up the memo. All this stemmed from a, <laughs> a memo that I, I, quite frankly, I don't remember writing, but evidently I did. It was from November 12, 2020. Uh, it was item 2B of that memo that talked about, you know, exploring the prohibition of foreign influence co uh, contributions. And so we've come a long way, and I really appreciate all the work from the city attorney's office uh, uh, and their consistent effort to move this forward and give us ideas and help mold and shape it. Also, Council Member Cohen and some of his staff, some of which are not even here anymore, that worked on some of this uh, a few years ago. Lucas Ramirez on my team that's done some of the work. Additionally, I believe some folks are on, potentially still online, they're in the East Coast, but we had Courtney Hostetter, Senior Counsel for Free Speech for People, and we also had Michael Sozan, a Senior Fellow from the Center for American Progress. I'm not sure if they're on. If they are, I think they're available and willing to, to share a few words and certainly answer questions because they were an integral sort of piece uh, of putting all this together. And so with that, I'll be quiet. There's the motion, and thank you. Great. Thanks, Council Member. Council Member Cohen? Yeah, Councilman Jimenez said most of what I was would have said, but we've been working on this for a long time. Uh, uh, Alexander Vatua from my office, had, you know, was instrumental in writing a lot of the details of this a couple years ago, and he's still working on this issue, I think, and he's a grad student at, at, at Georgetown now, uh, and um, so he's he's no longer with us, but I think it, it's great legacy of his that that we're moving this forward, and I'm really excited that we're that we're that we've gotten to this point. There's some important changes that came at the last minute with some work from Free Speech for the People that will clarify some of these things and I think make it a stronger ordinance and that's what's in our memo. So I'm just, I'm just excited that we are, um, you know, that we're at this point and looking forward to voting for it. Great, thanks council member. Okay, let's vote. Uh, just oh, Mayor, I'm sorry. If, I, Go ahead. if I may weigh in sure. just briefly. The the, uh, uh, this ahead. is one of those issues that's also been around a long time as, as mentioned by Councilmember Jimenez and Cohen, and I actually, when it came back, had forgotten that I was involved in it in the early days back in 2021. So I was pleased to continue to be involved in this issue and bring it back and have a good uh, ordinance in front of us to uh, protect foreign involvement in our elections. So uh, th that's it for me. I just wanted to say kudos to Councilmember Cohen and Jimenez for staying in there with us. Great. Thanks, Councilmember. Okay, Tony, let's vote. 
Jimenez? Yes. Torres? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? Yes. Duan? Yes. Candelas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Batra? Yes. Kame? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Motion passes. Great. Thank you. Okay, we're on to item 3.10, annual merit increases, an additional executive leave for council appointees. Uh, the Brown Act requires an oral recitation of what is in the resolution. We will adopt a resolution approving, uh, sorry, the question before the council is whether or not to adopt a resolution approving a 2.5% merit increase for the city manager, city attorney, city clerk, and city auditor retroactively effective to July 1st of 2023 and granting an additional 40 hours of executive leave to each of these council appointees for the payroll calendar year 2024. Okay, you all have the memo. Let's go to public comment first. Paul followed by Brian. Paul Slipper from the Horseshoe. If you are going to consider merit pay, the city attorney capacity who in the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary, to still take a position that defies logic and the factual basis for any lawsuit that is brought against the city of San Jose. If you consider that something of merit, then I say, yes, go ahead and award her because she's earned it. Because all this city attorney has done is in the face of factual evidence of racism inside the police department with the Muslim officer paid out $400,000. Secondly, the bite marks on Anthony Paredes's neck she says that that is not a violation of the law. Let that be your child, Nora Freeman, and see if that is a violation of the law. That is someone's child. Anthony Paredes was attacked on the neck. That dog was sick on him to kill, and you deny that that was a violation of the law. If this city decides that that deserves merit, then quit and take racial equity out of your mouth because it is still violence still continues to be perpetuated and i will continue to go on record and challenge the legitimacy of awarding a system brian hi well that was a challenging comment and thank the gentleman um i want to definitely Please, the auditors are wonderful. I'm so, so I'm sorry, if I had unlimited resources, I would produce auditors by the gazillion and have them go all over all the place at every single traffic light, you know what I mean? Because they have the ability to look at situations, take data from several situations, diverse things, and come up with suggestions that people can actually, Im actually implement. And I find that incredibly amazing. I really do. It's like watching, I took care of this, couple students out at Agnes that would take these thousand piece puzzles and they put them together but they would do it upside down without the picture and they would do it in less than an hour it's the most amazing thing um I could tell you a story for those folks out there that lived out there anyways that's off topic but you want real super spiritual kind of stuff that well and anyway people who overcome great pain like many of the appointed folks out here that's a very small compensation for what they've had to deal with the last since the pandemic or even before. Thank you. Back to the council. Great, thank you. Okay, I'll turn to my colleagues, see if we have a motion on the item. Vice Mayor. Thank you. So um, as a freshman uh, uh, councilwoman, <laughs> uh, you know, one of the things that um, 
I'd like to share is that um, I think uh, we need better processes in terms of our direct reports and um, the, uh, the way in which um, performance uh, measures are done uh, need some work. And I would like to suggest uh, maybe holding things in abeyance uh, I think uh, not that you know one deserves or not deserves or you know whatever, but I think that um, we ought to have better uh, a better system, better metrics to say to get to any increases in merit or get any increases in whatever, uh, whether it's executive leave or what have you. Um, we have clear delinea delineation as to how you get there. I don't think we have that. And um, so it, it makes it very difficult to me to, not that, I mean, that they don't work hard, that they don't, you know, that they, they actually have achieved a lot, but I also think that um, it isn't evident to me that uh, the way it's recommended here in terms of just giving a 2.5% and um, 40 uh, hours um, extra, because uh, it's really above and beyond what was given to everybody else, right? So, you know, we all got a 6%, and so I, 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 I can't equate, uh, you know, the work and the above and beyond. So I feel a little bit sort of, I'd like to hear what my other colleagues have to say, some of you who've been through this process, and I just, I just, you know, find it sort of difficult to say, oh yes, deserving, not deserving, is it, um, it's your recommendation, uh, Mayor, but, but I also feel that, you know, I only know what I wrote down in my assessment, um, in my feedback, uh, but it's sort of not, not as comprehensive and it doesn't give me enough information to say, oh yes, we established this as a, as a goal, this is what got done, this is how it got done, and all that. You know, I tried to read last year's goals, um, and, and for some I, I asked specifically, okay, well, what was it last year? And uh, that was very helpful, but I, I, feel, I still feel that we need a lot of work in terms of the process and how we get to say that, oh yes, we're gonna do an above and beyond what everybody gets. Yeah. I, I appreciate that feedback and agree that our performance review process for the appointees can be enhanced and that's certainly something I plan to bring back in the new year, presumably through the budget process. Your question of goals, my hope has been that the single biggest, most important goals for the city would be openly discussed, debated, integrated into the budget process through the focus areas and reflected in dashboards. But I think our appointees, given the nature of their work and the diversity of that work, it isn't always clear uh, the, the rubric that we've inherited is, is pretty high level in general, and I think we could do a better job of defining goals for each, with and, and for each appointee. So that, that feedback is, is taken, and, and I completely agree that we can improve the process. Also, going through the process this year for the first time, I think we uncovered recently, my team did, that um, not all appointees have been getting written feedback every year consistently, and that there's been some gaps there. So we wanna certainly tighten that up. This year, all appointees did get their full written feedback from every member of the council who submitted feedback, which was not 100%. So clearly, we need to keep working to improve this process to get better alignment around what success looks like, how we measure it, how we convey feedback, and doing it timely and in a concrete way. So certainly opportunities for improvement. Uh, appreciate that feedback. I had Council Member Batra. Did you put your hand down, Council Member? I can come back to you if you'd like, Council Member. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, my concern is very similar to what Vice Mayor's is that uh, that we have a sort of a blank kind of a increase or merit increase, and it's not targeted in a way uh, based on the visible performance area. Uh, like you said, that our performance process has not been, and this particular year, uh, I believe our <coughs> general raises have been already pretty high and uh, and it would be 
wanting another two and a half percent based on no specific uh, items is a little bit harder to justify based on the information we have. And um, <clears throat> so I think whether we approve it this year or not, I think the performance improvement process which you have next year will certainly help us make these decisions more uh, meaningfully. But, th but this year we, we should really consider something uh, if the appointees will consider not having this on the blanket given to them. Okay, thank you for those comments. Councilor Davis. Thank you. Um, I did wanna ask Jennifer Shembury down um, to talk about the, the merit increase and whether, I don't, so I, I know I'm long in the tooth compared to most of you on the council and I'm thinking this applies to all employees and I just wanted to ask the, if the merit increase is available to all employees from from their managers as part of the, can you talk about that performance yes. pay plan? Jennifer Shembury, Director of Employee Relations and Human Resources. So the MPP uh, programs, the Management Performance Program, um, applies to all of our managers, mid-managers within the city. So this is the same um, MPP merit increase process that we go through with all of our managers. Our non-managers are eligible for 2.5 step increases um, and then also in a very limited fashion an additional merit increase on top of that. Okay, and that so is in addition to the cost of living increase that we negotiate with the unions. Thank you. That was going to be my next question. I appreciate that. Um, so I just I think that it's important for us to um, well, I acknowledge that our process is not ideal. I, we changing the rules of the game right now, um, and and basing saying we don't have enough information for a merit increase right now. I don't think is fair to our appointees. Um, we can vote. However, you're going to vote on on each individual person, but I I think that it's important for us to have to have that vote tonight because. We, if we were going to change the process, we should have changed, like we should have changed the process before we did the reviews. So for this year, so I'm all in favor of changing the process for next year because I don't think we're, um, by any stretch of the imagination, uh, employing best practices for our reviews, and I think that it does a disservice for our appointees in terms of the um, the quality of the feedback that they get, but also um, for our just setting a good example, th frankly, for all of the city employees. So um, with that, I would, I would like to request that we uh, take each vote individually, um, but that we, we approve um, the, the recommendation here, but that we take each vote individually per appointee. Great. Do we have a second on that motion? Second. Okay, great. Second, Councilor Jimenez. Appreciate that. Agreed that the changes to the process are something we need to work out for the coming year and make sure that expectation is clear up front. Um, okay. Councilor Cohen. Yeah, thank you. And, th and thank you, Councilor Davis, for the motion. Um, you know, we have a. It, <laughs> It's been, it, I think, our, our review process that we do, and of course, most people in the public wouldn't be aware of the process that we follow to review our, our direct appointees, is somewhat less than satisfying. Um, but that's our problem and not the problem of the appointees themselves. I mean, they don't set that process, we do, and if we're not happy with it, then that shouldn't reflect on <clears throat> their performance and their, uh, their ability to get, uh, you know, a merit increase that a lot, a lot of our management employees get. And, I know all of us went through this process. All of our employees in our, in our working for all of us got the 6% that everyone else got in the city and got, uh, and met some of them then based on merit in our offices were also afforded additional uh, merit increases. At least those of us who, I maybe have to be here a year first, so maybe many of you didn't go through that process this year, but, um, but for those of us who have employees who've been here at least a year, we, we have that process that we, we can do to reward performance. And I don't think there's much dispute that 
you know, most of our, you know, that the work that our uh, direct reports do <clears throat> is exemplary in most cases and, and is, you know, there's an incredible amount of body of work that they have to do. And so, you know, I think that, you know, there's an expectation that we will have, we will con continue to complete this process uh, that we, as we've done in the past. And um, I, I think it's, it's fair for us to, to take this vote today. Obviously, we, we're under a backdrop of, you know, a budgetary constraints that we may face next year. So obviously, we always have to be thoughtful about that. Um, but I also think it's important for us to, uh, you know, in this, you know, in, for this small amount of additional budget costs for the four people we're discussing today, uh, it's, it's important for us to make sure that um, that incredible body of work that they are responsible for is recognized by the council. So um, looking forward to, to taking our, our votes on the, uh, uh, these increases. Thanks. Okay, thanks for those comments. Uh, Councilor Menes, are you good? No, I agree on that. Yeah, okay. I hope. Vice Mayor, go ahead. Yeah, I, I have one last comment because, you know, the cycles need to happen where you establish any kind of goals before, right? So I know that in uh, some, if there's any change, uh, it would need to happen sooner rather than later because we're already in December, so half of the fiscal year is gone, right? So if we change processes or do anything, I would suggest uh, s much sooner because then we'll have the same thing in the next fiscal year where, you know, we're saying, oh, well, you know, we already did that and we didn't get to it until October, November, and here we'll be another year away. So uh, timing is important, and I think that to be fair, um, and, and, you know, I understand what has been said about, you know, in terms of, of you know, fairness, but, but at the same time, I also think that we need to deal with it now so that we're not in the same situation next year, like now. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's a fair point. The, the sooner the better, I also want to make sure we, we do it well, and that may require some outside support and resources, but point taken. Um, Okay, any other comments, questions? I don't see any other hands. So Tony, the motion is to vote on the merit increase for each appointee individually. We have four appointees for whom this is relevant. Yes. Um, are we voting to see if that's the way we wanna go or are we just gonna start going through the appointees? That's the motion and the second. Okay. Yes. So let's vote okay. on. The process. I don't think we need to vote on the process, do we? That's the motion. Okay. So let's let's vote on the merit increase for each one, up or down. Okay. So um, city manager first? Or do you want to announce who's first? Sure, let's go with the city manager okay. first. Jimenez? Yes. Torres? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? Yes. Dwan? Yes. Candelas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Batra? Yes. Kame? Yes. Mahan? Aye. City Let's attorney. Go to the city attorney, please. Jimenez. Yes. Torres. Yes. Cohen. Aye. Ortiz. Aye. Davis. Yes. Duan. Yes. Candelas. Yes. Foley. Aye. Batra. Yes. Kame. Yes. Mahan. Aye. Let's go to the city auditor, please. Jimenez. Yes. Torres. Yes. Cohen. Aye. Ortiz. Aye. Davis. Yes. Duan. Yes. Candelas. Yes. Foley. Aye. Batra? Yes. Kame? Yes. Mahan? Aye. And City Clerk? Jimenez? Yes. Torres? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? No. Duan? Yes. Candelas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Batra? Yes. Kame? Yes. Mahan? Aye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. That concludes item 310. We are on to item 311, resolution on child care. There's no presentation, we'll go to public comment. Um, I have several cards for in-person speakers, so I'll start with the in-person speakers. When I call your name, please come down. The security um, will direct you to have a seat on the reserved, um, the, the reserved seats. Um, but first person on the microphone starts. So I have Rebecca with Working Partnerships, Lucilla. Oh, I only have two for this item. The other ones are different items. So um, I have those two people, and then I will go to the Zoom speakers.
I was going to say good afternoon, but now it's good evening. Good evening, council members uh, and community. I'm Rebecca Armendariz, Director of Movement Building with Working Partnerships. As a community member and a mother, I'm urging you to vote yes on this resolution for child care. Our county and our country are facing a child care crisis. Nationally, the lack of child care costs the U.S. economy $122 billion a year. Locally, Santa Clara County lost over 300 child care providers during the pandemic, over 200 of them from San Jose alone. Parents are struggling to find, ch to find child care for their families, and when they do, they're struggling to afford it. In 2021, the average cost of child care for an infant at a licensed child care center in Silicon Valley was $26,000 per year and $21,900 for a preschooler. We need to prioritize child care and invest in child care for our community. It's, a trans it's transformative and supports young children during their most important developmental stages. Quality child care helps young children build a strong foundation, making them more likely to graduate high school, stay out of the justice system, and have better health outcomes. Child care also supports families allowing parents to go back to work, have support, and build community with other young families. Finally, it supports our economy, reducing turnover and missed work for parents with young children. And the average cost to a small business is $1,550 for every day that a parent misses work due to child care challenges. Investing in our providers, which, is, which are mostly women um, and which are mostly women and minority-owned small businesses and also, is also an investment back in our local economy. I urge you to support this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, City Council. My name is Lucila. I'm here as a working mom who I can tell you for sure that I would not be able to be here if it wasn't for the support of my family just because childcare is so expensive everywhere, but especially in this area where the cost of living is so high. And everything that we do in the city and the future of the city depends on what we do with the children. We want to talk about crime prevention, you know, make investments in children. We want to talk about creating um, a good, a strong workforce invest in children, and so I hope that you will support the resolution. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor Kamei, for being such a champion on this issue, um, and I hope you all will support the resolution. Thank you. Jennifer, followed by Brian. Good evening, council members. This is Jennifer Kelleher Cloyd. I am the executive director of First Five Santa Clara County, and I'm speaking in support of the resolution. We are facing a childcare crisis nationwide, but ours is unique because of our incredibly high cost of living. We have lost numerous childcare spaces and it's going to take unique collaboration among First Five, our cities and our counties to resolve this with a combination of investments, creating more slots, developing infrastructure and facilities. I think I don't need to say this to you all, but you know that investing in childcare is good for business, our economy, it's good for families, but most importantly, high quality early learning is good for kids and it is a great predictor of other future life outcomes. I'm looking forward to hearing a yes vote from you all and then partnering with the city to make it a reality. Thank you. Brian, followed by John. Thank you. All, all, all everything on the side, aren't children wonderful? I mean, really, seriously, uh, what a miracle. Of course I'd be for this, um, but all on the more pragmatic side. You know, people have to go to work, and, and oftentimes because of the way things are, both parents have to go to work. I mean, and both parents should be able to go to work. It, it, it's, a, it's a tough subject, but please support this item, and um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. I appreciate it. John, followed by Nancy. Mayor, uh, council members, and staff, on behalf of the county superintendent of schools, Dr. Marianne Dewan, I would like to express our support for the resolution on child care, which reaffirms the city's commitment to supporting universal child care in San Jose. We extend our gratitude to Vice Mayor Kamei and council members Davis and Foley for leading this resolution. While the city has recognized the need for the attention to childcare for many years, 
This refocusing is very welcome. As the resolution notes, childcare costs in the city are extremely burdensome for families and access can often be confusing. The Santa Clara County Office of Education has been actively working to prioritize accessible childcare throughout San Jose. The SCCOE makes substantial investments in childcare, serving as one of the city's largest childcare providers through Head Start and Early Head Start and the state preschool programs. Additionally, it operates the Regional Child Care Resource and Referral Program. Beyond providing direct services, the SCCOE has committed resources to the development of policy initiatives that affect the entire city. This includes conducting a mid-implementation review of our countywide Early Learning Master Plan, which was recently published, and preparing to release a facilities plan in the very near future. We look forward to working with the city so these resources can be collaboratively utilized for the benefit of children and families throughout the city. Thank you for your leadership, partnership, and commitment to the expansion of child care services to support families. Nancy, followed by Paul. Hi, I'm Monty, the Associate Director of Health and Care Policy at Working Partnerships also urging you to vote yes on this resolution. And thank you, Vice Mayor Kamei, for your leadership and elevating this really important issue. Like so many other speakers have mentioned, we are facing a dire childcare crisis in our county. I know someone mentioned the high cost of living and that affects childcare deeply. In 2021, the average cost of childcare for an infant at a licensed childcare center in Silicon Valley was $26,450 a year and $21,900 for a preschooler. This is on top of the extremely high cost of living where parents of young children are basically being asked to pay almost a second mortgage just to care for their kids so that they can go back to work. Investing in childcare is not only investing in the youngest members of our community, their families, and the childcare providers that help take care of them. And in California, 96% of childcare providers are women of color. Childcare is also a huge investment in our economy, especially our local economy. According to research from the National Bureau of Economic Research, every dollar invested into childcare comes back to our economy by a factor of about $7.30. So even from a pure cost benefit analysis, this is one of the best ways that we can invest in everybody in our community. I'm someone who doesn't have kids and doesn't plan on having kids, but I know how important it is for us to still think of young kids and their families as members of our community, make sure that we're including everyone and making San Jose a place where young families can thrive. Unfortunately, San Jose and many other cities in our county have been losing hundreds of families over the past few years, largely because of the crisis, um, the, cost of living crisis and investing in childcare is one way we can make sure that families are really welcome and part of our community. Thank you. Paul followed by M. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. The fact that this has to come up as a council issue for discussion demonstrates a complete disconnection that this council has from the everyday lives of the Mexicano community, the Panamanian, the El Salvadorians, the Nicaraguenses, the 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 DFs, Michoacanos, Sonorans, there are names. They, there are specific regions of the world from which fuel the food industries, the janitorial industries, the motel industries, the, 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 the service industries, and the construction industry. And these are the populations that are tasked with having to bear the weight of that cost. For what? So that they can report to some construction site and make a developer richer? Paul, this by is on exploitation child care. Labor? What? Hey, hey, don't start trying to check me, Just stay on topic. The context in which I'm speaking, hey, I am on topic, homeboy. M. Hello, and thank you. I strongly support 
child care to low income families, not everybody. Thank you very much. Back to council. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. We'll go to Vice Mayor Kame. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to um, my, um, my colleagues, Councilmember Davis and Foley, who have um, also brought this resolution forward to um, really uh, demonstrate our commitment as a city and community to ensuring that childcare is accessible and affordable. You know, as a, as a mother and a grandmother, I see how difficult it is uh, having uh, my own working children uh, and, and how high the cost of um, a quality child care is in the region, um, they often say to me, Mom, it's like paying another mortgage. It's, it's so high. But, um, you know, every child deserves to be uh, cared for, and um, it's just not as accessible to everyone. And I also want to thank all of the speakers. I want to thank our staff, Angel Rios, Jill Bourne, and Grabowski, uh, for their support in bringing in um, some of the work that we do here in the city to support children and families and youth. Uh, and uh, I hope that my colleagues will join me in moving this forward and demonstrating that accessible, affordable, high-quality child care is important in the city of San Jose. Thank you. Yes, and I would like to move <laughs> my memo with uh, that uh, Councilmember Davis and Foley joined me on. Thank you. Second by Councilmember Davis. Councilmember Davis. Thank you. I, I, I want to thank you, Vice Mayor Kamei, for your leadership on this issue, and I want to add my thanks to the to the library and PRNS staff as well for for all that they do um, with, with all of our all of our kids, but especially. Um, the early early childhood years that are so formative. Um, I am a former chair of the city's Early Care and Education Commission, which no longer exists. It merged with the Library Commission um, during my during my tenure, and I actually applied for this commission after uh, our experience because of our, my family's own experience searching for child care for our two young kids at the time. This was many years ago, they're older teens now. Um, and childcare back then was expensive and um, it's more than double what it was when my kids were little. Um, I can't imagine having, having to pay that now. But I think there's, there's growing recognition um, in this country that other countries have already figured out that child care is a public good and our economic advancement depends on qu quality child care being widely readily available um, and and I'm glad that we have leaders like you and the president of the County Board of Supervisors Susan Ellenberg who is already working on this issue as well um, so that we can hopefully have more and better child care options um, and, and early care education as well uh, in, our, in our city and county. And I, I just want to point out, and I know staff is probably tired of hearing this from me, but I think this is an opportunity for further partnership with the county on, on this issue. We've, we've solved all the easy issues, now we've got to work together on, on these, these tough ones. So thank you, Vice Mayor, for bringing this forward. Great. Thanks, Council Member. I'll just check if Councilor Foley has her hand up. Tony? I, I don't, but I'll speak. <laughs> it's hard to get your As one of the co-authors, I'm going to go ahead and go to you for a quick comment, and then we'll come back to Council. <laughs> go ahead. Thank you. Uh, uh, I just want to thank the Vice Mayor for uh, taking the lead on this and bringing this forward and asking the two other women on Council to co-sponsor this with her. I know um, we're all, many of us are parents on council and have had to deal with childcare and how expensive it can truly be. But for those uh, frontline workers who are working in uh, lower income jobs, the ability to get daycare is really expensive and more than they're earning. So our ability to help and assist in any way to lower that cost 
by providing different facilities and, and working in partnership with the county will be a tremendous benefit. So this really opens up opportunities for us to really make sure that we address a really critical need, which is to provide more care, uh, child care facilities around our city for our workers. Thank you. Thanks, Council Member. Agreed. Okay, Council Member Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. And I also would like to thank Vice Mayor Kamei, as well as Council Members Davis and Foley for their leadership um, and urgency uh, for bringing this issue to the forefront. Uh, when I ran for City Council, the cost of child care was a frequent concern that I heard from working families in my district struggling to make sure children were attended um, and making sure that their needs were, were met. And, and for parents, especially our, our working mothers, lack of childcare is a serious barrier keeping people in either subpar working conditions or excluding them from the work, uh, um, the work field altogether. Um, I, I truly believe that universal childcare would allow parents to develop their own careers, pursue education, apprenticeships, workforce development opportunities, but uh, essentially increase the level of skilled workers in, in, our, in our workforce and in our communities. Um, and for, of course, our, our children, there's extensive evidence that early childhood education is a massive aid uh, to success in, in overall education. So I, I believe it should be a no-brainer that universal child care is one of the public programs that would make the highest impact in, in our residents' lives if implemented. Um, and, and while staff is engaged in the long-term work of exploring child care programs and advocating for it on the state and, and local level, I also applaud the measures um, in this resolution designed to expand access to child care um, in the short term. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Torres? Yeah, we have a super long meeting, so I'll, I'll be super brief. I just want to thank Vice Mayor Kamei and Council Members Davis and Foley for putting this uh, memo forward. Uh, I serve on NS NSC with Councilmember Davis and every month we get glaring reports on, on, on how the lack of investment has caused us to go into what, you know, what we now see is uh, challenging, right? The, the large unhoused population, right? Uh, and so for me, when, when I read this memo, and I go back to all the meetings, it's, it's very, we, we all know that, that it is the folks who lived in 95112, 95116, 95122, and 94127, right? Those folks have, they, those folks make a majority of our unhoused in the city of San Jose. And we all know that it's because uh, it was the lack of childcare and the lack of investment uh, that they had when they were kids. And so this re resolution, really speaks volumes on where everybody needs to work together and make sure uh, that this doesn't happen again and that we're investing in our youth and families. And uh, thank you so much to my colleagues for putting this forward, so. Thanks, Council Member. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Council Member Jimenez, go ahead. I wasn't gonna say anything and I was like, should I say anything? But, but I, I, I'm just gonna say, and I think you can relate to this mayor, and I'll just say it very quickly, is that I think oftentimes when we talk about childcare and things of this nature, uh, obviously important things, I'm gonna support it, I think we all do, but I think often it's framed, in, 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 and rightfully so in many ways, as a woman's issue, if you will, and, and I just wanted to say as a dad that struggled with kids that I remember combing my daughter's hair in the morning, dropping her off, trying to find daycare, doing all the same things. I just want to say, it really is an issue that affects everyone. So I'm, I'm as a man up here on the council, I'm very uh, uh, excited to be supporting it. I think it's very important. So I just wanted to share that perspective. Thank you. Appreciate the comment. Um, I do the drop off every morning, <laughs> though I will acknowledge the burden often falls more on my wife. So, um, okay, longer conversation we can all have. But uh, thank you, council member. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Torres? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? Yes. Dwan? Yes. Candelas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Bacha? Yes. Kimmy? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, we are on to items 8.1 and 8.2. We will have a joint presentation and public comment, but I would ask that we vote on the items separately if the makers of the motion could do that. 
Again, that's 8.1 and 8.2, expansion of Rue Ferrari and the Berryessa supportive parking project. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council, members of the public. My name is Omar Passens, Deputy City Manager for uh, Homelessness for the City. Um, I'm joined by Matt Lesh, Director of Public Works, Reagan Henninger, Deputy Director for the Housing Department, and Jim Shannon, uh, our City's Budget Director, as well as uh, Rosalind Huey, Deputy City Manager and Acting uh, Housing Director. In line with the Regional Community Plan to End Homelessness and a deep sense of urgency from this Mayor and Council, Staff is bringing today an item that will, items that will help accelerate bringing new supportive temporary housing and RV parking options for people experiencing homelessness. This is a part of a large overall program and an ongoing effort to create a range of regulated and supported alternatives in the community. The success of the city's interim housing program, over 70% of participants remain off the street with over half exiting the permanent housing is a tribute to many factors, including and especially the effort of those participants themselves and tremendous dedication of our service providers. Today's items uh, focus on steps necessary to get two new projects built, uh, which is no small feat with all the hurdles that can exist for these efforts. The sites you will hear about uh, required the planning department, transportation, PRNS, housing, real estate, and, and a host of other departments all to work with Public Works in a coordinated way to get to this point today. Now I'd like to turn it over to uh, the team. Uh, Matt? Okay, we'll first start off with the Roof Ferrari project and the location. So the, this is a project site that is currently next to the current Roof Ferrari EIH site. That's 5898 Roof Ferrari in Council District 2. The project site is off of Highway 101 off Burnell and right near Silicon Valley Boulevard. For the scope and the schematic design here of this project, you'll see that Roof Ferrari Project EIH is, has a capacity of 124 beds, about 82 units. Total, after construction, the entire site will have about 258 beds and 183 units. These numbers are approximate. Current design is at 30%, so we, we call those bridging documents in the construction world. Final design and final unit bed counts are to be, to be determined based on the design build entity as we go through our design. Staff is proposing a design build delivery process. The reason why is because this can expedite project delivery, allows greater efficiencies during design, the contractor is involved in that design, allows for greater consistency in costs as design progresses, allows for the contractor greater flexibility in procuring long lead time items such as electrical transformers, light poles, and prefabricated buildings and the like, creating more overlap between design and construction that will shorten the overall timeline delivery. It is a great project delivery method with a well -defined, when you have a well-defined scope. The design build contract procurement process involves two steps. Step one, we have an RFQ where we evaluate and rank the uh, statement of qualifications by the design build entities based on their qualifications to determine this, uh, to deliver this project. It was advertised on May 24th and the city's technical evaluation shortlisted three design build entities in it to advance. Then there's a step two to this process, which is the request for proposals from that shortlisted group of design build entities. The technical evaluation panel evaluates and ranks submitted proposals to determine the entity whose proposal will provide the best value to the city. The project documents are again at the 30% design with enough scope and design to determine the design build entities bidding for bidding purposes. The awarded design build entity transitions from these project to the project documents to completed construction set and then constructs the project. 
switching to the uh, 1300 Berryessa supported parking project, the location. This project site is, uh, has the same project as in, in the project title, 1300 Berryessa Road. It's in Council District 3, right next to Council District 4 boundary. The project site is northeasterly of Highway 101 between 101 and BART and adjacent Cavity Creek. Uh, the lease agreement was executed on June 15th, 2023, 122 month lease expiring on August 31st, 2033. For a scope and schematic design, 1300 Berryessa has about up to about 85 occupied RVs and 46 vehicle parking spaces, additional spaces for parking and storage as needed, uh, and unprogrammed, as in IE, unprogrammed par uh, paved areas. Uh, four common use modular buildings, restroom showers, kitchen, laundry, and case management, storage units, and additional site amenities. A bit of the process here. Um, so the CEQA documents were completed today actually just yesterday, and the comment period just ended for the initial study and the mitigation ne negative declaration period ended. One comment was received from PG&E that no issues, no new issues, and does not impact PG&E. So the next are a bunch of internal machinations of posting and communications and the approvals that are coming as we proposed. Uh, deviation from this current recommendations will cause a bit of schedule moving around, and will, as right now it's planned for award in the winter of 2024, uh, and construction starts soon. Um, and then the project completion would be late 2024. On to Jim. Good evening, Mayor and, and City Council. Jim Shannon, Budget Director. Um, just touch a couple of slides here on the, the cost and budget implications of the project. So we have both the projects up there on the slide for the Roof Ferrari um, EIH expansion, a total project cost of a little over $30 million um, with an operating cost once the site is expanded of about $5.2 million per year. The construction funding source is a mixture of previous one-time allocations from the general fund. We have a, um, about half of it is from the Homeless Housing Assistance and Prevention Grant, the HAP grant, and then some other funding in the multi-source housing fund. Uh, moving over to the Berryessa Supportive Parking Project, um, a, a cost of 19 million, and again, these are estimates pending the actual uh, results of the contractors that, that bid on the, on the project. Um, but what the uh, recommendation in front of you is 19, 19 million for construction, an operating cost of uh, roughly $5 million a year for site operations, the additional lease that Matt had mentioned there of one, 1.7 million per year. Um, the construction source here for this project is again, previous one-time allocations in the general fund as part of previous budget processes. And uh, the main reason that I'm sitting here in the box tonight for the next slide is um, talking about committed additions to the, to the general fund. And so as we embarked on the process of providing some, um, uh, the emergency interim housing, the bridge community housing, the converted motels and hotels, um, the approach to committing to those over a longer period of time was uh, to leverage the, uh, a number of one-time funding sources and external funding sources um, to be able to sort of build up a big uh, chunk of, uh, of funds to sort of build and operate these sites. But over time, because those fundings were one-time in, in nature, there would be a ramping up of uh, ongoing general fund contributions needed as those funds were, were spent down. So to the extent that we don't have enough external funding sources to pay for the long-term operating costs for these, for these sites, the general fund will step in and these will become committed additions to the general fund once we award a construction contract or give the authorization for a construction contract. So that's why um, that's part of the recommendation before you here. If we were to not do anything tonight and we just had the, the uh, interim housing portfolio that we have, um, we would need, um, on a preliminary basis, again, these are, these are early, early numbers. We're gonna revise all these numbers as part of our February forecast, but we would need some general fund contributions to start in 25, 26 at roughly five, five million dollars annually which would um, extend out to $30 million annually by 2028, 20, 2029. With the two sites before you today, that number would rise to approximately $10 million starting next year and rise to $50 million uh, at the end of the um, uh, five-year forecast. But we also want to think about the other ones that we are actively working on. So if we include Cerrone, Via de Oro, and the Cherry sites, um, that number uh, preliminarily goes to $38 million in 2425 and will be $70 million in uh, 2028. 29. Again, these are 
Um, these numbers will vary. They're going to vary depending on other external funding sources, the actual cost of the projects, the changes in operating costs, what Measure E revenue does. Um, and we'll look at all of these uh, again as part of our February forecast that will be released in the, a few months. So before you run on, just want to iterate what the, reiterate what the recommendations are for the two because they're different but similar. So on the roof Ferrari, we are seeking uh, your authority to use the design build construction method, which is what we need to do, and a delegated authority to uh, negotiate and execute with a not to exceed amount of 25 million and approve the contingency amount. Uh, the committed uh, actions, as Jim alluded, for the budgetary needs for both of those items, for that item. And then on Berryessa, it is to authorize, uh, again, a delegation of authority, to, sorry, let me be clear, so authorize uh, the Director of Public Works to approve the uh, initial study mitigated negative declaration for the project and then also delegate authority for the construction contract before we go, uh, go out to bid here, uh, not to exceed a $15 million with a 15% contingency. Again, the budgetary actions as noted by Jim on the two items. So with that, we are here for your questions. Great, thank you. So just as a reminder to everyone following along, we just received a presentation on items 8.1 and 8.2 together. We'll take public comment on them together. When we come back, I'll ask my colleagues to take up each item and, and offer separate motions in case we have any modifications of either staff recommendation. So we'll turn to public comment now on both items. Okay, I have Gail Osmer, Richard, Deborah and Mario, please make your way down and then I'll call the other names um, to fill in. So first person to the microphone, just step up to the mic. guys I don't know how you can stand it I'm so tired <laughs> been here for hours um, hi everybody thank you happy holidays I'm here to discuss RV safe parking at Berryessa um, we can't wait they can't wait for another year that's ridiculous absolutely ridiculous I brought some of my friends from Cruz they live in RVs I've had the housing director come out I've had staff from the mayor's office these people cannot wait. The lies and the disturbance that people are doing out there from the businesses, the business people now put up K-rails. Oh, is that legal? No, I don't think so. I don't think they got permission to put up K-rails so the RVs can't park there. We need to look into that. I sent pictures to everybody. K-rails, that's not right. The businesses are harassing the residents. Yes, it's been a mess for years. For years, I know that. But the last year, the last six months, things have been pretty well, pretty run smoothly. We are very get very much support from the Cohen's office. Um, police are out there tagging the RVs. They don't do anything. They just tag them and harass. They took somebody's truck that is a working person. He can't go to work now. They took his truck. Maybe he didn't have tags. So what? They are being harassed on a daily basis by the police, by the police, okay? And this is not right. I know your office has a million phone calls. I know your office does. But let's hear from the people what's really going on. And putting up K-rails is not legal. And I know they don't have permission. This isn't right what they're doing. We can't wait. We can't wait, city manager's office. We need to get this open in three months. Get the Thank you, your time. Um, I'm, I'm also going to add Teresa and Gary. So if I've said your name, please make your way down. Again, it's Mario, Deborah, Richard, Teresa, and Gary. My name is Deborah and I've been homeless. 
not to my fault. My, it doesn't matter why, but I didn't plan. I was a good member of the community, good. and this is where I'm at now. I just asked. I was just asked by a friend to go back to work at Kaiser. I can't do that because every day if I leave my home, my RV, it's going to get towed, or my vehicle even. It's it's hard. So where do I make the choice? The amount of money that you guys say it's going to cost, I don't understand that. Because we've been on our own. We pay for our gas for the generators. We pay for the gas for the RVs. You know, so we have power and light. We do that. We don't ask you guys for help for that. We do it. Whether it's from collecting bottles and cans, it doesn't matter. We do it. And whoever doesn't have it, we share. We, we, we let them, you know, somebody who, who just can't afford to put gas in for the generator, we have them hook up to somebody else. It's a community. It shouldn't take that long. If we're out on the street doing it, why can't we just do it in a place where people are going to bug us and they won't be ashamed of us? And we can continue and become better society members and go back to work because that's really what a lot of us want to do. It shouldn't take a year and a half, two years. We might not be the rounds then. I know with the cops coming by every night, shining their bright lights at us, it's very, very debilitating to our mental health, which is already down. Excuse me for my speaking. Even my father, you know, he's, we've, I've lived here for 57 years. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. My name is Teresa, and I've been living in my motor home for 28 years. My husband and I moved out of our house in 1995. I lost my husband in 2000, but he bought our motor home so I would have a home, one that they couldn't take away from me, whether it's on wheels or not. But I am afraid. I by myself, my husband passed away in 2000. We are a community. We help each other. We do. But we are being harassed. One of the young ladies woke up with a man standing at the end of her bed who was a police officer in plain clothes. He propositioned the girls for... Um, sex and drugs, and then one of the girls had to leave. He followed her out to her Jeep, and he arrested her. That scares all of us girls, because he confronted two other people down at the other. He parked four different spots on that street before he arrested uh, Julie. But some of the other girls said that he had, they, he had approached them and asked them questions like, do you have bubble gum or do you have gum? Do you have toothpaste? Do you have work? Now, me, I didn't know what he was talking about. I just found out what work means is drugs. I did not know that. We don't bother anybody. We pretty much stick to ourselves. What's happening with the build, the companies over there is... Your time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Did she say her name? Good evening. My name is Gary Nadel. I'm, thank you for taking the time to listen to us. Maybe I could take off where Teresa left off. Um, the businesses across the street have been harassing us. They've been making phone calls saying the things that are happening that aren't happening. There's no question about it. Uh, they have two security officers in, police in, the, in the parking lot across the street, and they're saying that we're breaking into cars. They're saying that we're, go we're uh, taking 
gas out of these cars? How's that happening when two security officers are standing right there all the time? They would have been getting calls all the time about it. They're not. They're fabricating these stories just to harass, to, to, to solicit the police officers to harass us on a daily basis. They're saying they're getting 18, 20 calls a day. This, this is not happening. Um, I hope that we can find a way to get this settled in a quicker manner because it's, it's a year it's just not going it, to, there's going to be a lot of people that, are, that aren't going to make it. They simply aren't going to make it. I'm a stage four cancer patient. I put off my treatment because I'm afraid I'm going to lose my vehicle. So I hope that we can figure out a way to get this settled in a quicker manner because they're doing nothing but terrorizing the people on the street there and the business are acting like, like they are the ones that are getting terrorized and there may have been a couple of select incidents not from anybody on our street that we know of um, that may have happened it's not a perfect world there's going to be problems but we come together as a group and try to keep any problems off to the side so that we don't get any problems or any issues with the businesses across the street and they continue to harass us as well as the police department has unfortunately some of them not all of them and um that's what i'd like to say this evening Hopefully we can get a solution to this quicker than a year because that's not going to cut it. There's a lot of people aren't going to make it that long. Thank you. Um, the other two speakers I called, it does not look like they came down, so I'm going to move um, to Zoom. But if Richard or Mario are still here, come on down and I'll go back to you after our Zoom speaker. Paul? Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, I want to thank uh, Deborah and Teresa for coming here and having the courage to be vulnerable in this forum and in this context. I respect you and I acknowledge your life experience because I know it's a fact. It's true. I started, I started shedding tears myself because I, I'm very close to this community. I've lived under the bridges. I've lived along the Guadalupe. And sometimes I didn't live at all. I just wandered the streets at night because I couldn't sleep anywhere because of the f that if I close my eyes, that if I close my eyes for just and, and drifted off to sleep, I was going to wake up with a knife. And these these are the fears that, that, that uh, certain council members cannot relate to at all. So I want to thank you and acknowledge you for bringing your truth to this forum. Secondly, uh, thank you for the uh, staff report, because for $26 million, we're getting 100 plus uh, capacity. That is a pretty good deal in my book. And there was a lot of advocacy uh, during the last... Uh, the last uh, council members, uh, it didn't happen. But this was advocated for four years ago. The one thing that I would like clearly articulated is the $70 million that is going to have to come out of the general fund to fund all of these programs through 2029. That has to be put on the table, and there has to be some kind of tax, maybe the equity in the homes in the red line districts, in order to accommodate that budget allocation. Back to council. Great, thank you. Um, I wanna thank everyone who offered public comment on this item, especially those of you in person. I appreciate you sharing your experiences with us and uh, very much share the sense of urgency as I know my colleagues do. We're gonna come back to the council on both of these items. If we can, I'd like to take the Rue Ferrari expansion, any discussion, comments, and motion there, and then we'll take the second item, if that's okay with my colleagues. Uh, Councilman Ortiz, did you have a comment on that first item? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you to Public Works, um, Housing, and the Budget Office on working to find innovative ways to bring these essential resources online as quick as possible. Uh, I just wanted to address something important in uh, the cost summary section of both of these memos, but we'll focus on the first one. Uh, as it stands now uh, with both um, the Roof Ferrari expansion and the barriers to supportive housing, a uh, supportive parking site, 
A general fund contribution of 10 million will be necessary in the 2024-2025 fiscal year to support the maintenance of the interim housing portfolio. In the 2028-2029 fiscal year, that need will increase to 50 million, as stated on the presentation. And then if we also move forward with, like we plan to do, with Cerrone, Via del Oro, the Cherry interim housing sites, these obligations rise to 38 million next year and rising to 70 million by 2028 and, and 2029. And then regarding, um, I know they'll begin to speak to it, but regarding the memo that was introduced from the mayor, uh, Vice Mayor Kamei, uh, Councilmember Torres, Councilmember Cohen and Davis, uh, I, am too curi I am also curious on why these projections um, for operation is, is just so, so high. Uh, the staff memo mentions that these figures are preliminary and will be revised prior to the release of the 2025-2029 five-year forecast at the end of February. Are they high because we are taking a more conservative approach with budgeting um, for estimating, for overestimating? Thank you for the question, um, Council Member. The, um, so the numbers are, are preliminary because, uh, yeah, a piece of it is, um, so the way we look at it and the way that the Council direction was is, you know, what are the other resources that we can bring to, to, to bear to support the entire interim housing port portfolio, and then what are the costs that are associated with it? So um, on the revenue side, those are things. So the, the major ongoing revenue source is a Measure E, so the slice, the 15% slice of Measure E. So we'll have an actual firmer estimate for where Measure E resources are going to be as part of, we'll have a little bit more data in, uh, in a couple of months. Um, the operating costs are still also a little bit up in the air because the, as I think the prior uh, discussion has been, that we are looking at doing a new RF, RFP for most of our sites. And so the cost for all those sites um, will be reevaluated and will, will be uh, revised based on sort of what that RFP is looking like and what our most recent cost assumptions are. So I don't expect the numbers to change drastically, but I do expect them to shift somewhat. And so they are, they are so high because um, the number of sites that, that we would be supporting would be sub substantial. Um, those operating costs that we have currently are our best guess right now before we do the, we finalize the analysis of the different operating models. So um, it's a level of service that the city had never budgeted before in the past and it really wasn't part of our por por portfolio. But as it becomes part of one of our core por portfolios, you know, that cost will be sub substantial. Is it sustainable, in your opinion? I mean, that's going to be, it's going to be a policy priority choice of the city council. I mean, certainly it is as a percentage of the general fund. It's, you know, $70 million in the general fund of $1.6 billion is certainly something that's doable. Um, but it will require some trade-offs almost certainly. As we, you know, look forward to put the forecast together, there are other services that would otherwise potentially be funded that wouldn't be able to. There may need to be some trade-offs of some other services that are not as important to the city council. That will we'll be really clear as part of the budget process as we go forward. So our, our, our goal will be to provide as much certainty as we can for the five-year forecast so the council can see this as part of the budget uh, deliberation process to see where that impacts the entire um, general fund budgetary position. And we will most likely be forced to have to continue to increase the investment from Measure E, I'm assuming. I mean, I think that's a total council policy call. So it could be that the council wants to, you know, change what that policy. I mean, how else would we be able to pay for it? It would be from the straight general fund, right? So it would be a trade-off within other general fund. Which would be hard items. to make. Okay. Um, the staff memo uh, mentions that the, oh, uh, sorry. Uh, that also mentions we'll be refining and optimizing operating cost models and continue to pursue additional external funding resources. I wanted to, so refine and optimating entails what exactly? Would there be cuts in certain services to make these projects more affordable? And what happens if additional external funding is unavailable? Are we left to cover these tremendous costs? Hi, Council Member Reagan Henninger, Deputy Director of the Housing Department. I can speak to the refining the operational model. Um, if you recall, in October, we brought forward a study of our interim housing site and some recommendations to try and reduce the operating costs, one of which is maybe relooking at how we do security. Um, another of is partnering potentially with the county and the housing authority on a different operational model for interim housing where you're taking 
uh, individuals from our coordinated entry queue and um, some of those operations would be subsidized by the county and the housing authority. Uh, we are in the, one of the things, the outcomes of that study was to standardize some operating procedures for our interim housing sites across all of our sites. We're in the midst of finalizing those standardizations and putting out a request for proposals in January for new operators for all of our interim housing sites where we are hoping to see some cost savings, again, whether it's in security um, or some different staffing models. But to your question about you know, why are these so expensive? Um, it is because the housing department has designed our interim housing sites and our supportive parking sites with a focus on very rich supportive services that are all focused on moving, helping individuals move to housing destinations when they leave the program. Okay, I, I appreciate that and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, that last part of moving out of the interim sites into housing. I think the, um, the sizable investment here um, really speaks to the need for us to have a balanced investment with both uh, interim and uh, permanent supportive housing um, to make sure that there is areas for us to, to transfer um, these individuals from to get better uh, services and support. I, to be honest, I'm I'm concerned about the high cost uh, uh, of these sites, and that's part of why I had my position um, around Measure E in, earlier in the year uh, anyway. So I'm going to be watching. Obviously, we need this, and I'm going to support it. I'm going to vote for it, um, but uh, I'm going to be, I'm gonna be uh, looking at these uh, uh, discussions a lot closer just to make sure that we're managing our money correctly. Thank you. Thanks, Council Member. Um, also share the concern about operating costs, something we have to manage very closely. Uh, and I'll have more to say on that regarding Berryessa. I'll go to Councilmember Cohen. I'm going to say I'm waiting for the next Oh, you're waiting on Berryessa. Okay. I'll move 8.1. Thank you. Any other, do we have a second on 8.1? Councilmember Cohen, any other comments or questions on 8.1? That's the expansion of Rue Ferrari. Go ahead, Councilmember Botcher. Yeah, so, can you get a clarification on the roof for expansion construction cost? Is that all coming from the grants from the state or or is it coming from part of it coming from us? It's roughly 50-50, council member. So we have roughly 50% of that is coming from um, a couple of state grants. Mostly the, um, that most of that 50% is the HAP funding, the uh, uh, homeless housing assistance and prevention grant program. The other half is uh, previous one-time contributions from the general fund that we did as part of um, the last two budget cycles. Okay. <clears throat> but the operating cost is all coming from our general funds. Uh, our, yeah. our funds, whether they were taken from Measure E or whether they're general funds, right? The operating costs will be a mix. So we'll look at that. So every every year, um, the housing department and the budget office will, will sort of look to figure out how best to divvy up different pots you know, to the extent. So we will prioritize the use of external grant and grant funding first. Um, and then we will do uh, general fund where and uh, measure E and then pure general fund where we need to support. Um, it's a sort of a site by site basis. And so it's hard to say what the mix is of these ones. We kind of look at it in the overall port portfolio. So recently, when, uh, Governor Newsom announced $300 million for uh, encampments, uh, resolving encampments. Is that possible that we'll get for some money for operating these things, or is that even if we get it, it's for building new, new capacity? Thanks, Council Member. Uh, the encampment resolution funds, we did receive funding in round one. We plan on applying for this most recent round and will include an ask to support our interim housing efforts. So, so it may be so, available yes, for operating, operating cost? Yes. Okay. okay, so I am concerned about number one, the cost Number two, I'm also concerned about when we 
talk about building these new facilities. We don't talk about any cost associated outside of the EIH. I know that PRNS takes care of it, but I think in order for us to be able to have the community around it to be comfortable, I think it will do us a better job if we present that additional cost, if there is going to be any, and if we are able to do as a freebie, that's even better. But I think as a comprehensive proposal, it should be presented what we are going to do inside the EIH and what we are going to be able to do outside the EIH. Because we agree that these people cannot wait, but you also want these people to be well received by the neighbors where they are going to be coming. And the current trend we are going on does not make us very popular neither does it make them welcome. You can already see it, that they're being harassed and all that, and I don't think you want to put them into that position. So my request would be is that I only approve this for expansion when you bring in, along with it, the information about how you're going to maintain the outside of the EIH to a satisfaction to the neighbors. Uh, I would not be comfortable from the community standpoint to be approving this amount of expenditure and also not having it, I'm not comfortable with the expenditure itself and then I'm not comfortable at all that we have nothing stated about what we are going to do outside the EIH. So as a result, I would say that I would like this proposal to go back, come back in January with that additional added information and find a way to make the operating cost model to be lower than what it is because this is like uh, my colleague already asked, is it sustainable? It doesn't look like it's sustainable. We're not going to have in our $1.6 billion budget $70 million available for operating these. Unless you think we're going to be able to get county to take over or some grants are going to be available, I'm not sure that we would want to be able to commit that kind of a money. And this will become committed because once you build it, you're going to house it. Okay. Thank you, Council Member. I, I think I would need a response on that one. Are they going to be able to do anything about the cost? Uh, well, the, we, we just had a pretty, uh, you're welcome to reframe a question that's maybe a little more specific. We did just have a pretty exhaustive conversation about the home base report and adopted a number of recommendations. I also think this ongoing discussion around the community plan to end homelessness and potentially moving some of the sites into coordinated entry is extremely promising in a conversation we're having with the county. Um, I, I think you're welcome to ask staff more specific yeah, questions. I just so, didn't hear one. So, so Mayor, with the current cost estimates, I'm asking that they to come back with a newer cost estimate, a newer cost model, and also include how they're going to take care of the area around the EIH. Otherwise, you know, th this proposal is not good enough to be really approved at the moment. When would the recommendations that, that Council adopted regarding the home base report and the operating model for EIH, when, when would that come to a committee for an update? That might be a natural checkpoint. I'm sure we will also have further discussions during the budget process next, starting next March. Yeah, I, um, the council gave us some direction when we heard that item about coming back for an update. I think, I think it was around six months after we started uh, implementation. So our our goal is we were releasing a procurement in January, um, and we would have new operators in place for the start of the new fiscal year, July 2024. So we would come back to you all. Well, you would see also through the budget process estimates, an updated estimate or forecast for the site operations. But today, today we are being asked to commit to 
these $31 million in expansion, construction, and also to $5.2 million for operating cost. And I'm saying that I think $31 million seems to be getting funded, part of it from the one-time sources, which may be okay, but the operating cost is going to be coming from the general funds, and I'm not comfortable with that, that I think I'd like to see a lower cost projection plus the services to be what will need to be presented around the EIH. Because with those, the community is not comfortable with that one, and as a community representative, I'm not comfortable with that. Councilman, if I could, okay. if, if I could offer the, sure. the, what's before the council tonight is the authorization to proceed with the work on the construction. So the operating cost um, will come back to you, what Reagan said, when we um, have the agreements there. So I think the, so the council is not making any decision tonight on what the operating costs necessarily are. I think we're just providing what the, what the um, model is and what the cost is currently, but there's um, no direction that staff is recommending right now to take action on what the operating cost will be because we still have to do the RFP for that. I think the other place for the conversation, so um, previous council direction was to uh, in, in include operating and maintenance cost of the sites, you know, once they become committed uh, for those construction contracts. If council were to change that and to broaden the scope of what the costs are for an EIH to include the things that you are suggesting as in terms of um, uh, any abatements around the EIH site, that certainly could be a council policy call that could be discussed as part of the budget process. So, so I would like, if we are talking about that, then I would like to make sure that our, if the approval we are giving, we are giving only from the construction cost, and you're saying when you come back in January or whenever your time frame is, with the operating cost, the operating cost proposal must include the additional cost, if there is any, of the services around the EIH. Do not come back just with the EIH operating cost to be just the inside the gates. Okay. I, I, yeah, I think if, if council gave us that direction, we would come back with that. That's what I'm making as a motion to with this one, to motion to approve with that additional item of the request. And, and then council can decide whether they want to go with that or not. Just to point of clarity, Mr. Mayor, I think there's maybe a motion already. Yeah, I've, uh, yeah. thanks. We've got a motion on the floor. Um, I, I do think this question can come back in a lot of different ways. If you want to offer a friendly amendment, you're welcome to do that. We can also take this up during the budget process next year. I think for additional, I think what we've determined is to, to dictate to staff additional work outside of the EIHs in any consistent way, we likely need to identify the resources or the trade-off that we're willing to make. So that does feel like a budget conversation, not to say we can't have it now. But why don't I ask you if you want to try to make a friendly amendment to the maker of the motion. So, do we have a motion to approve? We have a motion to, we're, we're just on the first item, 8.1. We're just on Rue Ferrari, which council's already given direction to expand, and it's all broken down here. There's a motion to adopt, to approve. So I want a motion to adopt that and come back for the operating cost to be with the additional services, if there is going to be any additional cost, but the spell out the additional services which will be needed to maintain that area clean and, uh, and, and acceptable to the neighbors. Okay, so what I'm hearing is a friendly amendment, if I may, is um, a question, Councilor Jimenez, of whether or not when staff comes back with an update on the operating cost for Rue Ferrari, they can incorporate an estimate of what it would cost to do enhanced services around the site. We're only talking about Rue Ferrari expansion right now. So is that your request? Okay. Not just an estimate. We want a commitment just the EIH is going to be done. Then there will be additional services to maintain that clean. And whatever that cost, that's the approach going to be. Yeah. A, a better way to handle that may be through the budget process as we talk about managing the areas around EIHs and understanding the trade-offs there than taking this as a one-off. But I'll, I'm sorry, Councilor Jimenez, it's your motion. Yeah, I would say that I feel most comfortable addressing this through the budget process. I, I obviously I represent the area and I, and I understand what you're talking about. There's no immediate 
like across the street type of residences. Their basking ridge is, you, you know, you have to make your way down another road and go up a different, you know. And so there are residents around there and we're actively engaged with them. I've been engaged with them for many, many years. We actually started a, a, a business or type of business association there a while ago where in which we were having discussions about some of the impacts actually before we even built the Rue Ferrari site because um, of some of the RVs that were around there. And so I think my office is, is, is working. We, we've talked about this numerous times and I know internally we actually meet with the stakeholders in that respective neighborhood. Um, and I think we have a fairly under control, so that's why some time back when I, my office was approached about the expansion room for Aria, that was a logical location because we already have a space there, uh, and it was up against the freeway, and, and it wasn't causing problems as we saw. There were some folks that were um, in RVs and such, but th those were issues long before this came forward. So all that to say is I think it'd be better, best, better addressed with the budget process. I appreciate, you know, your ask about the additional services, what the actual cost of that will be. Uh, I think that's a worthwhile question, but I think it's, uh, it'd be better placed as it relates to the budget discussion. Um, and, and, and as you know, we've actually got, I think it was like 300 or $400,000 funded for some enhanced services uh, how much was it, uh, Omar? It was 350. It was about three. Sorry, I know I upped it a little bit, but uh, about 350 thousand dollars for enhanced services. I, I don't quite remember exactly where those were going to be implemented, but to the extent it can be in and around this location, those are the, some of the things we're exploring. So I, I feel comfortable enough to just approve it as is, and then have that discussion. Let me try it one more time to ask that question. You see, you seem to separate between creating EAH and operating it without talking about the additional services. What I'm trying to convey is that that should be looked upon as a one item, that EAH operation means having the additional services. And, and, and I know that's a novel concept for a lot of people to think about it, but it is not that in terms of if we want acceptability among the community, you have to look at it as total cost of doing business, and that's not how we are looking. I'm just trying to present that. If it doesn't make any sense to you, that's fine, yeah. but it is. It so is. I would say when you say additional services, are you talking about like there's a garbage on the side of the road near the location? What, what does it cost for us to go by there and pick that up and keep the area clean? Is that what you're referring to? Yes, and, and I don't want just an estimate. I, what I'm asking is, that when you say we are operating the AIH, you're operating inside, you're doing certain things, it costs you that money, that's what we are approving, 5.2 million. A along with it, whatever it costs you outside to do it, let's do it as a part of the total project. Okay? I, think, I, I think the challenge I have with that, just as you're clarifying this, is that that's a moving target, <laughs> right? I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't imagine that the staff is going to be able to identify, okay, it's going to cost 150000 to keep this respective area clean. Things fluctuate, in, especially in that area, very frequently and, all, and very often. And so I think it'd be difficult to nail down an exact number that's going to be utilized to make sure that area is clean because it changes. And that's why, as a representative for the area, I have the eyes and ears of what's happening there. And when, things, when there's an uptick in things, we sort of reach out to the respective departments. But I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't, it doesn't make com complete sense to me. But I understand what you're getting at, and I understand there is a potential cost. I mean, as an example, if they said, okay, we're going to set aside $100,000, but then we didn't have any issues, then does that money just flow back into the pro I mean, these are the type of things we need to think about, right? And, um, and maybe I can just add please. on to Councilor Jimenez. I, I think it's a good point. You know, last year as we tried to grapple with this issue, uh, a couple things happened I just want to highlight very quickly. One is staff actually put together an MBA and, and offered us a breakdown of their initial estimate of what it would cost to provide certain types of enhanced services. I think we looked at that and said, okay, that's a pretty big price tag, and at least at the moment, I don't think the council was willing to make the trade-off to go apply that across all sites. I think we also had some conversation about how different sites need different things at different times, to Councilor Jimenez's point. For those who are interested, MBA 35 from this year's budget process breaks down the cost of different types of enhanced services. There may be other services we want to cost out. We may want to push back on the estimate and say, does it really need to be that expensive? Are there other ways of achieving these outcomes? I think that's a very productive conversation for us to have. 
um, uh, you know, either through the budget process or, or elsewhere. I'm not sure here with the roof Ferrari expansion, unless the you know, council members suggest, you know, there's the, the majority of the council feels there's a need to add that to this item. I think the operating costs inside the site are actually contemplated and reflected here and estimated out. Now, when we get to the next item, Barry has the support of parking, we are acknowledging at this early stage of that project, we would only be moving forward capital costs tonight and not committing ourselves to the operating costs. So that is a more fluid conversation. And, and as an example, just I'll, I'll just say this last thing. Literally down the street from this location is where we're building the police training facility. And so once that's up and running, there's more activity of police officers going in and out of that space all day. I suspect that the area is going to have less and less issues, right? And so I, I'm not even sure we're going to require all that many resources, dollars, if you will, to, to actively clean up that site, because I think folks are naturally not going to want to be in that area, because that's where a lot of the police are going to be, I think. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I'll just make a last comment, and then you can move on. All right. Okay. Final, final yeah. comment. Final comment. Go ahead. Okay. I, I understand what you're saying, uh, Councilman Hermanis. You don't need to set the money aside and all that. But the issue which you're not addressing for the neighbors is that, yes, you're going to take care of the things outside. You're going to take care of the things inside, that's pretty clear. But you're going to take care of the things outside isn't being stated anywhere. Whether you allocate any money right now or you don't, that's fine. But uh, it is not a satisfactory statement to the community, but I'm okay if you, that's the way you want to move on. Okay. Well, I would well, I would say I know that community well, and what I would say yeah, is you do that, certainly know that well. But, but what I would okay, say is Councilmember yeah. Mendez, final comment, and then we're voting. Uh, addressing the things outside, whether we allocate money or not, is the responsibility of the council member and the city sort of departments on a daily basis, irrespective of if we allocate specific money. And so, those things are going to continue to be addressed, whether we say we're going to allocate a hundred or two hundred. And so, I feel confident that we can do that now. But I, I think. During the budget discussions, I think those are relevant things to, to raise. All right. Thank you. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Torres? Yes. Cohen? Ortiz? Aye. Sorry. Sorry. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? Yes. Duan? Yes. Candelas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Batra? Yes. Kame? Aye. Mayhem? Aye. Thank you. Okay, we're on to the sec to 8.2, which is the Berryessa supportive parking piece of this. Now, just to clarify a couple of things, there was the initial staff recommendation, there was a group memo, the intent of which I think was largely to get more information and look at how we might control costs. Staff issued a supplemental today that gives us a very detailed breakdown, which I appreciate and is good fodder for our conversation here. Let me just confirm with staff, the request, just to be really clear, is to, obviously we can give you feedback on both capital and operating, and they are connected. That's why it's important to look at them together. But you're asking for the authorization to go bid out and approve the capital investment and come back with further discussion and approval of an operating contract at a later date. Is that accurate? That's correct on the capital side. I want to make sure that the, on the operating side it's different department. Reagan, does that accord with your understanding of what we're being asked to yes. do this evening? Good. Okay. Thank you. All right. So we'll talk about both. Both are fair game and they are related. What we decide to do on operating can impact how much we need to build out on the capital side, but the only hard decision that council is being asked to make tonight is to approve a certain amount to go forward with a bid, an award of bid, at the discretion of the Director of Public Works conforming with what's written here in the memo for the capital construction of the site. Okay, uh, I, I will ask Councilor Cohen if he wants to kick off the conversation. Okay, let me, let me try to gather my thoughts here. I'm gonna start, <laughs> I'm gonna start first of all by uh, a kind of a preface this by saying that I think that the work that everybody who, who involved in this does is incredible and it's hard work and I don't necessarily envy any of you who have to make these decisions and have to make this stuff happen, um, trying to clean up our city and trying to make these things done. I, 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 I say that mainly because I'm gonna say some things that don't sound so nice. 
<laughs> as I go forward. But I also want to appreciate the folks who came out and, and talked about their experience, because and constituents of my district who are living in very difficult conditions and are waiting for us to provide them with some relief and service. Uh, this is why I've been pushing for, um, you know, for us to have a solution and a site, and time is of the essence. So, I, so I'm, I'm going to, you know, my, my, my first point here is that, you know, we, we got, a group of us got together to talk about this memo, and we had somewhat different objectives that all might align, but also were somewhat different in the sense that there's concerns about cost, there's concerns about timeline. My primary concern and objective is moving fast, because we, you know, the residents of the city can't wait, who are housed, the residents of the city who are unhoused can't wait, um, the businesses who are affected can't wait. Um, I think our environment can't wait. There's a lot of things that I believe can't wait. So I'm going to start with a, with a for, and then also just comment that I feel like we're in the twilight zone when we have these conversations. Because I feel like we have the same conversation every month. We ask the same questions. We ask why we can't go faster. We hear the same concerns from people about cost every time. But we've, you know, we have to understand where we are in this phase. We as a council have approved building these sites, and they're important, and I, I stand behind that, and I think we all should stand behind what we've already decided to do. And what, we're hope, what I think this agenda item was about today was expediting the process by giving you authority to move faster without having to come back to council for every contract decision. Is that, is that correct? In part, yes. Okay, partly, yes. In so part, that's yes. the part so that the I'm... The other part is the secret part. And other th yeah, it yeah. Is, I mean, is there's, other, there's other details of this. As rapidly as possible, yes. I like to oversimplify, so right. thank you. Um, so I, I have a whole lot of questions, and I, I know I'm going to try to be cognizant of my time, but I think some of these are important. Um, as I mentioned, all this is absolutely necessary but costly, and we asked for some fee breakdown, and I really appreciate the quick turnaround of that breakdown after the memo came out to give us a table with all this work, and I think... We would like some clarification. I know, you know, having talked to folks my Brown Act about what all these line items entail, it's not clear to me and others what the difference is between mobilization and general conditions, demolition site preparation, earthwork, and exterior improvements are, for example. What goes in what line and, and you know, all those seem to be things that we're saying all have to be done and, and, are, and have no wiggle room on. So, you know, what does that mean? What do those items mean? Can we have a quick summary of that. So when an engineer estimate gets produced, it's meant to be informative to like what the possible expectations are for comparison purposes against bids that come in. As line items or the contractors, one contractor, their dirt work could be cheaper than the others, but what do we expect that dirt work to cost? We did tons of bidding on things like airport construction for the deep runways and taxiways are all pretty much the same. Make the thing flat, put the concrete in, and you're done. But some providers own the rock and so it's cheaper for them to build things, and so they can build light on it. So that's why we have, what, is it, what do we think, in our best estimate, and given the current market, what these buckets cost? And so we aggregate them. They get to be super detailed lists, and then they break it down into these buckets like this. And then we use it as comparisons against the bids that come in from the contractors. And then that is the actual true cost to build it, because we don't know. We, I mean, you saw the thing, at, for example, a, a good example is the Police and Trading Academy. That, that those bids came significantly under engineer's estimate, which was a surprise to us. We went through those things in detail. And sometimes they're under and sometimes they're over. But you know, we hovered to try to get to our goal has been within 5% of our engineer's estimate. Um, now, granted, those numbers are based on the 50% design because the design, the 100% design, just completed a week or so ago. And now they're going through all those machinations to get to the final engineer's estimate, which is not yet produced. And so this is out of typical order for sure. Most of the time this thing is fully baked. We go out to bid and then we bring it back to you to authorize something that has full, very crisp and clear numbers. These things are more like uh, ranges of what we expect this bucket to cost. And granted, these numbers are preliminary. That's why we're going to kind of put a bunch of asterisks and swirly lines around it because we don't, we, they're still not done with the engineer's estimate for the 100% design, which we just oh. completed. Okay. We're I, just I, moving as rapidly as hearing exactly what you're saying, hearing yeah, what Denise I, I, says, yeah. move like heck. I understand. I, and I don't know that we'll, I mean, maybe someone else will ask a question in more detail about figuring out what's in, the, what's in the line item. I think the mayor wants to know more, so he will. But I want to move on to some other, other parts of this. So thank, thank you for the clarification. Um, 
you know, and, I, and I, the, people, the people who came and spoke to us today and the people for whom this is really important don't really care about any of this, right? <laughs> they don't really care whether the curbs are perfect or the, uh, you know, the, everything is done up to some code or whatever because people are finding vacant places to live right now that are not up to code, that are not where they should be living. And th this is why I get angry about this conversation a lot because we keep having the same conversation over and over again. And I'll remind, I mean, there were some of you that were in the room, you know, and I don't, I don't get worked up a lot and get really angry, but I, you know, you, we were in a room at the conversation back in August about the timeline for the site. Keeping in mind that we're paying $1.5 million a year as of July 1 to rent this property that we're, that no, we're not even using yet. And we're already paying this annual rent on this property. And the purpose of this is to, is to get people into a place that will be better for everyone, the community and the people who are living on the streets or in their RVs. So, you know, I, I've just been, get, been getting very frustrated, and that conversation we had back in August was, that, that got me worked up, the answer was, we'll be ready to go by September of 2024. And then I said, that's unacceptable, it has to be faster than that. And we talked a lot about how to expedite the timeline. What can we do to squeeze it out? What can we do on the, on the engineering side? What can we do on the, on the contract procurement side? What can we do in parallel? And at the end of the day, I felt like maybe two weeks was squeezed out of that timeline for all that work, which, you know, again, um, frustrating. Uh, today, there was a, a, a notice, a, a, a timeline in this presentation that said late fall. To me, that means we've, we've moved the goalpost. We, we've actually had negative yardage since the last time we talked about this, and that, that doesn't make me happy. Um, so, I mean, I, we can get to clarifying that timeline, but, I, but I, you know, one of the things in the memo that we put out asks for a timeline clarification, a detailed timeline of when people can move on to the site. It also talks about a phased approach that prioritizes opening the site sooner, which is something that I find that we have to figure out how to do. We have to be creative. We have to, we have to solve this problem. Um, so, let me ask a few questions then. Um, How much, so we're, we're granting you authority today to bypass some of the usual contracting provisions. How much time do you think that that is effectively saving in the process by doing that? I would estimate it's probably like six to eight weeks because we would wait for the normal bid process. Normally you wouldn't be hearing this until probably February, late February or March in the ordinary course of things at this time of year. We go out to bid, we have to have the pr protest period, it gets reviewed, we make sure we put together the, the, the council memo and all that's, you, at the fastest it would probably be end of February in the normal course of things that you would see, here's a bidded contract, you, uh, it's over my authority, do you approve it to go forward? And then contract execution, and then they're, they're mobilizing shortly after that. Um, again, depending on what the component of what the construction is, um, one of the reasons why we're trying to move as rapidly as we can is so we can get these elements moving. Yes. Okay. Uh, Jim, in the staff supplemental memo under costs, does that operating cost include that $1.5 million annual site rental? Is that part of that operating cost? No. Okay, so that's, that's, that's in addition to the fact that we're paying Correct. the $15 million over 10 years for the site. Okay. Um, This might be a question for Reagan, I'm not sure, but um, there's concern about the operating expense here. We are already, as a city, spending a lot of money on enhanced cleanup, on mitigation, on things for people who are living in the conditions now on the streets. At what point can we, you know, at what point of doing all this work can we begin to say that there will be actual budgetary cost savings because we have people in these sites and we're not having to be spending the resources in the uncontrolled environment. Is there some way to, to get an estimate of that? That's a really hard question. I, I knew it would be that. <laughs> what do we, just as a ballpark though for the council member, what do we spend annually on our source sites, just as an example? Do you happen to know ballpark? Uh, gosh, ballpark is, I'm gonna say, Six million or so. It's a couple different contracts um, with two different providers uh, that are focused on uh, a dozen or so of our largest encampment sites. 
So I think we should all keep in mind that this is not in a vacuum that we're spending this money on these sites, that this is in the context of the fact that we're spending money as a city on this issue on an ongoing basis. And the question is, what's the best way to spend those resources? So I, I just want to remind people of that point as well. There is no doubt in my mind that doing this is the right thing to do. Now, I'm going to try to formulate a motion, but it's going to be incomplete when I do it, allowing input from others to, to sort of at, you know, amend as we go forward. Um, but before I do that, I just want to say one other thing about the phased approach issue. I know that there's talk about, and in here is the, the, three, four million, the $3 million for modular units, so we have on-site services, the building out of bathrooms and other facilities that, you know, right now people who are not living on the site don't even have, advan have right? They're, they're using RVs, they're, they're dumping their waste, but we, there's, there's lots of ways for us to do this that are different. We have, there's, there's ways to have mobile waste collection as opposed to the, the, the you know, things that people have at, at permanent RV parks, for example. There are temporarily the ability to put in a portable toilets and wash stations while we're waiting to build out the permanent facilities so that we can begin to move people onto the site at a certain point. So I'd like us to think creatively and seriously about what do we need? And we understand that there's been some soil issues and we want to make sure that people are safe when they move onto the site and we have to take care of those environmental concerns. But it seems to me we ought to do that first, get the site ready, move vehicles on, and continue to do the work while vehicles are on the site because that will be better for people than waiting for the completion of everything that we want on the site. So I, I see that you're reaching for your mic, so you have, I don't know if you have a response to that. But I want us to think that about that seriously. Do you, you want to have, do you have some feedback on that? It wasn't a question to me, so I, I didn't mind. No, I know, but I... <laughs> of course, I, my wheels are spinning. My job is to think through answers to, to help you get to the place where you're trying to get with the constructed world in the way you want it. Um, I think one of the issues that we think through when we go to phase things, because everything underground should be done so all of the things that we plan to go on, we plan to go that we need to go underground has to go. That that's all part of the existing cost. Anything that would be later on brought in, you're working around an active construction site, and there be, gets additional timing and cost implications to thinking through that operation. So it gets to be a longer done process to be. So these are the things we would need to trigger through. Um, yes, we do not have multiple phasing options that we had thought through to get to this current place. We literally were pushing our designers as much as we could, paying enhanced fees to get these designs done as rapidly as we can to get to this. Now, if we need to phase it or think through those different operations, modulars later or something else later, not modulars, but what does, is water needed there? Is power needed there? Those are the kind of things we would need to contemplate, the things we would need to strip out. Can we do that without modifying the documents enough so I can still get this thing out to bid? Those are the contemplations that we have. And so that's why we were looking through like these ad alternates that we listed in our memo. The, the way we describe it is just give us an additional cost like you saw on the Police Training Academy. If you want to replace the roof, what would you charge us for the roof? And then we have so the base product right now would be without the modulars. But we, if we get a really good price, we might want to choose or they say the schedule, they've got a source form and it happens really rapid. It might be the prudent decision to implement. And so based on, is it more important to the now cost versus the operating long-term cost? And that's, that's the debate for the information and direction from you. Okay. Um, so I'm going to uh, make a motion that sort of combines some of the things in here. At this point, I'm gonna leave the staff recommendation. I know that our memo talked about A1 and then B. Uh, I'm gonna leave all of A and B in the motion for now and then we'll discuss it. Um, I'm going to suggest that from the memo that we all submitted that we include 2C, but the second half of 2C, which says considering a phased approach for allow opening the site sooner, and 2D, which is the time, creating a timeline detailing this whole thing, and of course, number three, working with the county and cost sharing model. Um, as an aside, I hope that you know, we'll get, continue to get some help from the state on operation, and I know that the League of Cities and others have a priority to continue to push the state for those large investments in, uh, home, in uh, homeless uh, operation uh, dollars. So you know, we'll, we'll continue to see whether that's possible or not. But um, so that's my motion is, is I'll, I'll move staff recommendation plus two, second half of 2C, all of 2D, and item three of, of our joint memo. 
Okay. Thanks for the motion, Council Member. Second from the Vice Mayor. Let, let me jump in on a couple questions to build on Council Member Cohen, and then I'll then I'll come to the Vice Mayor. Um, I, personally, I believe that we need to. I, first of all, let me also thank staff for all the work that's been done here. I know uh, we have greatly expanded our our operations in this area. It's very significant. It's a lot of new territory, and I appreciate the quick turnaround on the supplemental. What I would like to emphasize, and I want to thank Councilor Cohen for uh, how well he expressed his sense of urgency in, I thought, a constructive way, and I know how hard he is working to identify sites in his district and, and provide solutions to homelessness. The scale of this crisis is so significant, and as you all know, the impact is now. It's immediate. We just heard it directly from people who are out there that we need to push ourselves increasingly to be looking at speed and scale. What can we do that is faster and more scalable? And part of that, of course, means it's more cost effective. And I just, I, I think we need to shift our frame of reference. I would argue with this site, we heard from folks, I've been out and talked to many people in RVs, there's, there's, they're coming with their home. There's some infrastructure there. They're already out on the street. And I just, I think we need to push ourselves, we need to challenge ourselves to not just do this nicely designed version, but to also say, what is the minimum viable product? What would it look like? How fast, how cost effectively could we do it at the minimum that we would be able to move RVs on site? What would that look like? And what, what would be the ramifications of that? If we just capped it, put in some lighting, made sure that appropriate drainage, we met basic code, and we basically just built a parking lot and allowed people to move and assumed very low service provision. Because again, these folks are already out there every day. They're there. <laughs> they just happen to be out on a, on a road in an unmanaged environment in front of a business where they're, they're you know, not getting along with their nearest neighbor and there's a lot of conflict. What would be the minimum viable product for getting RVs on site? I mean, it's nice that we're getting into a full build-out with service levels approaching an EIH, but as we just discussed, there's significant ongoing operating costs there. I'm not convinced that's necessary to start. I'm not convinced the folks out there asking for three meals a day or full-time case management or 24-7 security, on and on and on. So what is the most stripped-down, basic, viable product for capping the site and getting RVs there and off, away, out, out from being right in front of operating businesses and schools and daycare centers like today or as quickly as possible. What would be the, what is the simplest scoping? I suppose I'll take that. For the construction part of that, um, the utilities underground are going to be needed one for fire protection, because there is no access to fire protection in any of that area. It would be prudent for us to put some of the vegetation around there, both for water treatment and for it so that it can go someplace. It's essentially a box, and there's no great place for that water to drain right now, so we need to provide that access. There is no water back there. There is no sewer back there. There is no ability to put trash anywhere. So some of those things you start putting, like, what are the, is trash basic? Those, like, yeah. those are the kind of questions. Well, when I visited when Safe Parking in Mountain View, they did, they had folks come once a week to empty the RVs, and they had folks come once a week to pick up the trash, and I saw a couple of porta-potties at the, one of the sites I visited. But it was a parking lot. So I hear you on drainage. It's got to have proper drainage. That's fair. But sorry, Matt, go ahead. No, so those are the things that we're considering is, is do we have lighting on there? Is it adequate? It is safe without lighting. How do we get power back there? What kind of power? And if we're building for power for just the start or do we build for something that is coming in in phased approach? It's a bigger electrical build. Those are the kind of things that we're thinking. Sure. So, so we need water. It needs to have fire suppression. It needs to be able to deal with drainage. It needs to be paved. And so all of the stuff underground should be done before you cap it, otherwise you're just ripping it out again. Okay. And then what do we need to do about anything around trash or any of those? So we could, those are the kind of contemplations we're going to have with the sure. contractor as we go to design yeah. and finish I, design. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I will note, and I have a follow-up on it, when I visited Mountain View Safe Parking, 133 at a cost of, I think you have in your supplemental, one point, 
six million a year. All, all the RVs I saw there were on generators or solar panels. Um, they were, it was basic, it was, it was, it was, you know, the fastest way of getting people off city roads away from being right in front of schools and, and businesses and, and daycare centers Mr. and whatnot. Um, Mr. Let, me, let me ask, of the scope you just described, Matt, compared with the revised potential estimate, and I, I may have some follow-up questions on the revised estimate, but that still comes out to $11.36 million just in capital costs. The scope you just described of the bare minimum, the minimum viable product for being able to move RVs there, how, how is that just an order of magnitude? What, what, how does that compare to the 11.3? Is that a quarter of that cost, half of that cost? I mean, what, I'm just trying to get down to what does it cost to do the most essential things that we feel we must do before we can allow RVs there, while acknowledging they may be right down the block already on a city road. Part of it I have to ask housing what operations they need and what do they need for their operations at that minimum. If it's zero, then that's well, let's assume if operations if, are if, like if, Mountain View. You have a case. Okay. You have you have staff that drops by daily to check in on folks. You have people who come by to pick up trash and empty the porta potty weekly. Uh, maybe you have an over. Maybe you have one person as overnight security. Mountain View doesn't have that, but let's say we do that. I mean, that's that's. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm, again, I'm going MVP here. What if we do that for a couple of years and see how it goes? Yeah, I think that there are two things that it's just useful for as you make this decision to be aware of when you're talking about the interplay of capital and, and operations, right? M Mountain View. One of the issues that we have in San Jose is that there are several inoperable vehicles at a range of locations, and so when you make the change, which wasn't the case in Mountain View, not to have inoperable vehicles be able to potentially get service on site, there's an impact there, right? The other big thing I think to be mindful of is we're talking about putting a fence around a site, right, where there are RVs and so there's some level of, of fire, not just the infrastructure for fire suppression, but actually monitoring for fire, right? And so what does that look like, right? If we're going to create a new site. So just to be aware that there are some differences between what we're talking about, what Mountain View does, doesn't mean that we shouldn't figure it out, sure. but I just want to make sure yeah. we're... That's fair. I still want to get an answer to the question, though, of, of ballpark, how that compares to the revised estimate. On your point, though, since you brought it up, Omar, of uh, the uh, inoperable vehicles, have we ever costed hiring a contractor, a mechanical, a firm that uh, would repair RVs that we could have on contract to fix them so that they become operable? I know that may not be in the cards for 100% of the vehicles out there at this point, but uh, have we, do we have any sense of, of the 700? That, that's the other point here. When I talk about speed and scale, 750 RVs on the streets today in San Jose. We're talking about $15 million in two years to address 100 of them. So that's where, that's where this urgency is coming from, is this, this fear that we're not actually doing it fast enough or in a way that is scalable enough. So do we have a sense of the 750, how many might be operable, how many might be repairable, and how many truly we need to get somebody an alternative and eventually junk it? I mean, do we, if we, do we have a rough breakdown? Of the 750, which is our point in time count data, we don't have an estimate of, or that specific breakdown of what's operable, what's inoperable, what's determined as junk. Okay. Do we have any sense? No. Okay. I do not. You don't want to speculate. Fair enough. Okay, Matt. Sorry. Back to the, the thought experiment. If we went with an MVP here, and then I'm going to stop because I'm probably over my 10 minutes. We're the MVP here. Uh, what, how would that compare to the 11.3 or the 15 for that matter? What, I mean, ballpark. What do you think? Is that a few million dollars? Are we? Well, it's more than a few million for sure. Okay. What does it cost to pave the site? I know we have to cap it. That's, that's inarguable. We got to cap it, right? Again, we don't have the final engineer's estimate for what this total cost would be. And so this is, these numbers here are based on the 50% design. So I don't know all of the asphalt sure. yet. And so I'm just saying ballpark. <laughs> oh. Well, sorry, okay, let me ask this. Which item here is the capping? Because you, you did provide estimates. So the exterior improvements are part of, are, are baked in there. That's where the asphalt paving, concrete, okay. concrete landscaping, and fixtures are. Okay, what are fixtures? Uh, fixtures are anything from... Um, if you're putting in a bike rack, I mean, those are all de minimis costs compared to everything else. Okay. And so all of those things, if they're putting it, awning is part of over in the community area so they're not sitting in the sun if they're outside. Those okay. Kind of all right. So capping this thing, you're saying capping it's likely three or four million dollars roughly? Yes. Okay. That's one of the big drivers that we probably can't get around. Okay. I recognize these questions aren't totally fair, but um, 
I'm trying to get us to think about what is the fastest, cheapest way to get RVs off city streets onto this site, which I think was the spirit of Council Mayor Cohen's comments. Let me uh, cede my, let me turn it over to the Vice Mayor. Thank you. So uh, Mayor and uh, Council Member Cohen have asked all my questions, so I have no questions. <laughs> uh, but I guess the only thing that I wanted to say is that this is critically important, but timing is of the essence. So if there is any, any possible way to find uh, a way to move vehicles as soon as possible without the frills and the bells and the whistles, please, let's do it. Let's just do it. Let's not think, oh my gosh, it has to be. And I know that we want to make it in a condition that is going to be uh, is good for a long time. But I, I just want to ask, please, let's just do it sooner rather than later, and they've said enough. Um, I also want to let my colleagues know that I have a lot of community members that have come for another item. They've been here since 1.30, so I ask you to please be as brief as you can. They're here for 10.3, so I just want to share with that. I apologize. Sorry that you're here so late, but uh, just wanted you to know that they've been waiting for a long time. Okay. Thank you for highlighting that, Vice Mayor. That's helpful, and I apologize for the wait. Uh, okay, we will speed this up. Councilor Cohen, your motion was on the original engineer's estimate or the revised? Uh, you mean, no, I, I didn't, I just left the original in there because, you know, part of what I want to say is that I think that granting the authority for the entire thing is, you know, is okay right now. Our, the question I want to, I mean, the question is how do we give direction about what are the reasonable reductions, but I also don't want us to, to ask for reductions that then they have to come back for another action later because it turns out we need to go back to the original estimate. So, you know, authorization for the original estimate to me is okay, but with direction, <laughs> maybe with some direction that says, but we want to reduce certain things. It's, and obviously this, this is a rush decision. We just saw this memo like an hour before the meeting today. And so to make a quick decision about what changes are Sure. The right changes uh, today is a little yeah, bit hard. Understood. For me. I, I guess in the spirit of getting to a, a vote, I know there's a motion on the floor. I, I guess I would recommend from the revised potential estimate that we that we punt on the modular units as is contemplated in the revised estimate. And I would ask on concrete, metals, and finishes, painting, building, footings, decks, ramps, and stairs, if that 1.2 million needs to be in there if we're not planning to do modular units anytime soon. And the reason I would, I'm not trying to pick on the modular units in particular, I guess I am, but you know, if, if we need some space for folks, I think we could start with mobile units of some kind. We, I, I don't know that we can commit to a service level at this time that is so robust given the, the operating costs. I'm not sure that we can treat safe parking just like an EIH, and, and mathematically that's roughly what it's looking like here. So I, I would suggest, and I'll, uh, you know, you can reflect on that, and if staff wants to comment, that's fine, but I'd suggest that we push out the modular units and take another look at the concrete metals and finishes that appear to be for those modular units, unless I'm missing something. In part, yes. So trash enclosures and around the trash enclosure has to have concrete because otherwise those garbage trucks will tear up the asphalt you just put down and you'll have a mess. And same thing with, um, Perhaps if you wanted any building in the future you, or any other power thing that would need the power supply for those things, do all of that now. And one of the considerations is what could we do so that it is modular ready? Should that be decided later? That's sort of the contemplation. Sure. Like you, this was whipped up by us fairly rapidly as yeah. well. So could the pencil be sharpened? The answer is yes. Perhaps the idea would be instead of if, if it helps, if rather than give direction of line item by line item is say maybe it's not 15 million maybe the threshold for authority is less than that and come report to us in January with an info memo of what actually occurred through the bidding process and that gets us moving along I can get staff finalizing the design I can get them things that I can sign and get out on the street and get real numbers sure. as opposed to yeah directional if, numbers. If, if your preference is a is a target rather than pulling out specific components that's totally reasonable I think Councilor Cohen was trying to go the other way to give you flexibility that's a conversation we can certainly have here um, if so I would certainly advocate for getting down closer to that 12 or 11 million or I mean I would personally push for lower in terms of modular ready 
again, can it be above ground electrical hookups near whatever hookup you've created? Does it have to be underground? The I mean, most I'm, expensive I'm concerned part that is going building... to be those power, like all the power hookups and all of that other stuff. It, it's the stuff that makes it ready. It's, and those equipment are extremely expensive and time time consuming to acquire. And so one of the things about modulars being an option, and so if we get a fantastic price on modulars, I probably want to advocate to shove them back in. If we don't get it, and if it doesn't yeah. can't mess up the schedule, not having to put, acquire modulars would save us on schedule, which is the sure. thing that I'm seeing is the major driver, not necessarily getting from 15 to 12. And that's why I like the idea of the high ceiling, but I also understand it gives me the most nimbleness, but it, in terms of to yeah. get what I'm hearing from you is get this done as rapidly as you can so that people can rapidly use the space. cut out the nice to haves. I, yeah. I appreciate the point about phasing. I thought at Villa Deloro in the final analysis we found that actually by going off grid and having some solar with battery backup, it was good enough and it was actually more that build out seems quite a bit lower. Um, that, again, that one is first done, never done, never maintained yet. We don't really know the cost of ownership of that whole thing yet. So it's, it's an interesting experiment that we're interesting to learn about. The initial costs look appealing and we're interested to see what that does in the long run. Okay. I would just say, I, I think that infrastructure needed for modular units for folks coming out of tent encampments needs to be more built out than folks who are literally already living a block away in their home. That is just, I mean, the priority right now is getting the RVs off city streets. Understood. That's the that's the priority. So, Councilor Cohen, I don't know if you want to leave it I, yeah, at the I mean, 15. I, I, I'm a little I'll just say two, two with things the total that I heard. Tag, two things that I heard. Yeah. Uh, I heard a comment about you know starting lower and coming back if there's if you get good you know good pricing or whatever. But I, I I just want to make sure you know one of the points of this was to make sure that you don't have to come back and slow anything down. So I want to make sure that whatever we do doesn't slow it down. So that's that's yeah. priority number one. Um, so if we're at 12, I don't think we can put modulars in. And I think there's a risk if it's at 12. And if that's the answer, I, I just, that's the information that we need in terms of the design teams. The implications will be what does that mean for operations? Do they need something right. different? And then do we transfer some of that cost? I don't know if it's all of well, it to operations, and that's the decision that the operating department would I mean, modular make. assumes a service level comparable to an AIH. Yeah, and I'll just add one other thing, which is, you know, while, while I know that, I don't know the intention of every, of every individual who would take space on this site, but I know that our intention as a city is that people are being helped to transition into something other than living in their RV on this site, and that's beneficial for them, but it's also beneficial for us because we want the site to be not just for the first 85 yeah, RVs, but for some turnover so that we can address more of the 750. So I, I, I do want to be careful also about limiting that potential service. To me, the most important thing is phased. And so by phasing, you end up spreading out the cost, maybe being able to come back later and say, hey, we, 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 you know, we, we can authorize this part, but you know, and make a decision later on some of those details. But the phasing will save us money for the, in the short term, but will also get us going faster. To me, that's the priority, and I just want to be careful about choosing from a menu the things that might not be the right things to choose for the expediting of the project. So that's the only reason I'm hesitant. But I, I, I'm, you know, I'm happy to reduce the number. But I think, I think maybe they've heard from this. You know, Matt and others have heard from this conversation that our objective is for you to be really thoughtful about what do we need. And and as long as you hear that as our primary objective then I'm okay with keeping this dollar in here, but making sure that you are aware that we, you know, we're, we'll be satisfied even if we leave something out of the full project. Message delivered and received. Is that, I just, that, okay. I have a question about <laughs> clarifying the council's intent for a minimum viable product for the services. Is your intent that inoperables be towed to the site? That's helpful for me in yeah. terms of thinking about the site and the services needed and the cost, frankly. I mean, I think we have to have a plan for inoperables, you know, and I'm, I'm okay with inoperables being part of this, but that's an operating expense question more than the capital expense, isn't that? I understand, but you all are asking for a minimum viable oh, product yeah, yeah, yeah. for capital and services, as I understand this discussion. For capital. Yeah, yeah. For capital. I, I think... Um, that is a good question and one we should follow up on. I guess, to the councilmember's point, I, I'm not sure that, the, the, how does that affect the cost of the capital investment? Well, I think it impacts predominantly 
the operating expenses. Right. But I'm trying to... You're planning ahead for the next phase yeah. when we come back. Correct. Yeah. It's a reasonable question, and we're, 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 you know, while we're, while we're being very, at least I know I am and the mayor is being very, pushing really hard on some of this stuff tonight, it's also, I don't want to rush into a decision that's the wrong one. I, I understand, that's why I was saying, I understand that, that the level of service will matter at the end of the day. Um, I, you know, the, to the purp I think the purpose of today's action, and let, we're going to have that, that operating expense discussion in the spring. I think we ought to maybe think through before then what we really want out of the site, have some meetings with you to talk about it. Um, but, but I want to make sure that we are using tonight to expedite the actual build out as much as we can. Just to underline one thing, sorry, Regan, that uh, Matt Lesh mentioned, but just want to be really just explicit about it. Removing the buildings, understand the conversation. I totally get all of it. Just know that, uh, like, p portable restrooms, gonna have to, they're going to have to some way to go, to go to the restroom. So taking that out of the building just means there will be an ongoing cost associated. And we'll come back with that as part of the operations. But just want to make sure council knows that that's a, an, an item that, that will have to be worked out. It's a good call out. Fair enough. Thanks. Okay. I mean, if you if if you're satisfied with the motion, I'm satisfied. I'm. I'm <laughs> let's move forward. Uh, I appreciate it, everyone. Uh, and just checking on Councilmember Foley. Does she have her hand up, or can, are we ready to vote? There's no hand. Okay. Let's vote. Jimenez. Yes. Torres. Yes. Cohen. Aye. Ortiz. Davis. Duan. Yes. Candelas. Yes. Foley? Aye. Batra? Yes. Kamei? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Davis? Yes. Thank you. And Ortiz? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, based on the Vice Mayor's comments and the number of folks we have waiting for item 10.3, it sounds like, we're going to jump down to that item and then we'll come back to the rest of land use consent. So let's go down to item 10.3, a general plan text amendment to amend the Santana Row Valley Fair Urban Village Plan located at 425 South Winchester Boulevard. There is a short staff presentation. Then we will go to public comment. I believe the applicant has an opportunity to speak and then we'll come to the full council for discussion. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Ruth Gueto, uh, Principal Planner with PBCE. With me today is Michael Brio, Deputy Director, um, David Keon with our CEQA team. We also have a couple of other planners on um, virtually, uh, Laura Miners, who is a planner for overseeing the special use permit that's associated with this, but the special use permit is not part of the action today. We also have members of the Department of Transportation and Public Works um, if there are any questions on, on that um, issue regarding the special use permit. Uh, let's see. Okay. So staff is recommending that the City Council take all of the following actions. Adopt a resolution to approve the ISMND for 425 South Winchester Boulevard project for which an initial study was prepared, all in accordance to CEQA as amended. Adopt a resolution to approve a general plan text amendment to modify the Santana Row Valley Fair Urban Village Plan, figure 5-2, building height diagram from 65 feet to 85 feet on an approximately 0.55 gross acre site located at 425 South Winchester Boulevard. And to modify the Santana Row Valley Fair Urban Village Plan, figure 5-3 setback from 40 feet to 20 feet and the step back daylight plane from 45 degrees to 55 degrees for new development when it is adjacent to residential and urban residential land use designations. And finally, to modify that same figure 5-3 so that there is no setback and no step back plane required for new commercial development when adjacent to sites that have a residential neighborhood land use designation with an existing legally established commercial use. This slide provides some information on the site, 425 South Winchester. 
Um, it is um, currently a vacant gas station and auto repair business that operates on a month to month basis. The applicant is proposing the general plan tax amendments to facilitate their special use permit, SP 23-005, to demolish the structures on the site and construct a seven story hotel. This um, slide shows the surrounding uses of the subject site, which include retail, commercial, and restaurants to the north, an office building, um, Santana West, and Winchester Mystery House to the south, Santana Row to the east, and single family residential to the west. This is a land use map that we find in the Santana Row Valley Fair Urban Village Plan Area. The site is 425 South Winchester. It is where the blue arrow is pointing. The site has a mixed use commercial land use designation and requires ground floor commercial. The letter P with the circle means that the plan envisions a floating park or plaza. The applicant is aware of this but has not proposed any park or plaza at this time. This is a want and not a requirement of the urban village plan. So moving into the proposed general plan text amendments, what this is showing is the one of the amendments, which is to increase the height from 65 feet to 85 feet solely for the property in question. Staff has identified 85 feet as an appropriate tra transition between the surrounding building heights, with, which range from 35 to 150 feet. The current standards for new development adjacent to residential land use designations is 40 feet side or rear setback and a 45 degree step back plane. The applicant initially came to us with a proposal for a 20 foot side rear setback and 75 foot degree plane, which is why we have the 75 line listed here as well. But after receiving um, public comment and deliberating alternatives, staff believes that the 20 foot rear setback and a 55 degree play, daylight plane is appropriate for um, a, as a modification. Sorry, I think I skipped. Okay. Okay. And I'm sorry, I'm still going to stay with this slide. <laughs> If um, the text amendments are approved by city council, any new development adjacent to residential and urban residential land use designations would be required to have the 20 foot and 55 degree foot play, uh, daylight plane. In addition, the applicant withdrew an initial request for a general plan land use designation change and associated conforming rezoning for an adjacent parcel located at 390 Spar Avenue. Instead, the applicant is requesting a new text amendment which states no setback or daylight plane are required for commercial development when adjacent to sites that have a residential neighborhood land use designation with an existing legally established commercial use. 390 SPAR, which is adjacent to the hotel site, is the only site that currently has residential neighborhood land use designation and an existing legally established commercial use. I'd also like to add that while the language says that there would be no adjacent, um, no setback or no step back in this situation, the project would still be subject to the mixed use commercial zoning standards and those zoning standards uh, require a minimum 10 foot rear setback. Some of the neighborhood concerns that we heard during our uh, community outreach um, the two virtual community meetings we held and an in person meeting we attended are listed here. Um, these common, uh, the common concerns include the proposed hotel itself, its operations, traffic impacts, daylight and shadows from the proposed hotel, changes to the urban village plan, and the setback and step back daylight plane. Um, the Planning Commission staff report includes uh, staff's responses to these issues. In summary, traffic impacts and hotel operations can be addressed through the special use permit process. As for the issues related to setback and step back plane, staff believes the setback is appropriate given the existing setbacks on the site and that the reduced setback would support intensification of the site pursuant to the goals of the general plan and the urban village plan. The change of the daylight plane from the initial 75 degrees, uh, which is a citywide design standard, 
to 55 degrees is an acceptable compromise to allow some flexibility while still providing step backs for single family properties. And that concludes our presentation and this is uh, again staff's recommendation. Great, thank you. Uh, my recollection is we give the applicant an opportunity to speak. Would the applicant like to present? I believe it's a five minute time limit. Five minutes. Oh, let's make sure we get that mic on. One second. Don't worry, we'll pause the timer. Okay. There we go. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor and uh, members of the council. Mark Gersini, the, the owner of the property at 425 uh, Winchester Boulevard. I want to be really quick with my comments because I'd like to have uh, the architect that's been um, extremely involved in, in the design of the project to, to do the comparison of the project that I already have approved, which was a, a project that conformed to the uh, urban village plan. And I went through the process when I first purchased the property uh, approximately three years ago. Uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm in front of the council tonight because that plan, I can't build a plan. I can't attract the capital that's necessary to build a plan. And so we went back to the drawing board, actually brought in the Lowney architects who specialize in the hotel uh, design to design a building that actually can be built in today's capital market. Construction costs, as we'd all know, have gone up tremendously. And after, uh, even with the construction costs, we've now had a big push on the interest rates. But given that, I'm very confident we can move forward and build this hotel. So with that, I'm gonna let uh, Jung Sa come up and uh, walk through a few slides with you. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Good evening. That's okay. Just as a check, how much time is left? We, we did pause it, so it's, it's at 3.30. So we okay. paused it while Three and a half minutes. Go ahead. Three and a half minutes? Okay. And the timer's uh, on the podium. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jung Sao from Lowney Architecture. I wanted to give a brief overview of the project. I think we can skip this slide. Everybody knows where the site is right now. Let's go to the next slide. So a couple of things we want to point out is as we develop the plan, wanted to create the most efficient L-shaped plan. And our main objective was to take the Massey, the most of the Massey, and put it against Winchester and also put it against Olin Avenue so that we're creating the deepest setback away from residential. So you can see some of the dimensions there. The main massing is about 47 feet to our property line and then an additional 79 feet or so to the first residential building. You can also notice that there is a small commercial building on the very left hand side and then the residential goes beyond that. As far as access, we have all pedestrian entries off of Olin and Winchester. And then vehicular entries, we have the drop off and parking off of Olin and the service entry off of uh, Winchester. Next slide. On the ground floor on the left hand side, you can see that the main objective was to create as many active uses along Winchester as possible. We have a lounge, a lobby, dining, and some meeting spaces along Winchester and around the corner onto, onto Olin. And then also the drop-off zone, the main drop-off zone for the hotel is off of Olin. If you look at the second floor, we do have a small amenity deck. Um, we have a small water feature there, a little bit of light beverage service, a fitness center that's directly adjacent to the outdoor space and some lounge spaces there. And we do want to highlight that we do have an eight foot privacy wall all along that amenity deck. And then the sections through the building, the main section, section A shows the cut you can see at the diagram up above. You can see the 47 foot step back along the property line there and then a 21 foot step back here at the base. And you can see that the height of the building is 85 feet.
This is one slide we wanted to point out, the original entitled residential project, you can see that in the dotted red line. It actually encroaches farther and closer to the residential, even though it is 20 feet shorter. We feel that the building mass, the way it is right now, is actually farther away from there. And the other thing to point out is that when it was residential, we had all the private decks facing the residential. The hotel does not have any private decks on there. And then as we start to get into the character, we did a context analysis of the existing site. You can see some of the residential character on the west side of the site is all single family homes. On the right side, that res the residential zone is multifamily. And then some of the commercial character there, everybody knows Santana Row. Uh, we have a series of office buildings towards the south. And then towards the north, we have a large parking structure and the Best Buy. And if you look at the character of that, it's sort of broken up vertically. You know, there's, there's color changes, material changes as you go down Santana Row. And that is something that we, we paid attention to as we decided to, um, to design the project. And here's the main view at the corner. Okay, thank you. Okay, so moving on to public speakers. Um, I have several cards. I'm not sure if everybody is still here, but I'm gonna, I'll call like five names to start. I have Raza, Bill Schaefer, Jane Wolf, David, looks like Duquette, and Phyllis Weber. Um, come on down, take a seat in the first row. If, if you're not the one with the microphone, you can go straight to the microphone. Um, if you have something you wanted to display, we have an overhead projector you can use. Go ahead. Wait. Can you unmute the mics instead? Hello, everyone. I live about three uh, houses down from this hotel, a future hotel. Because of this, I will be deprived from um, reducing my energy costs and relying on the solar opportunity. Um, I learned a lot during this process. I learned that planning commission process is flawed and one-sided. Planning Commission kept providing opportunities to the applicant Mark Desini to speak again and again outside of his allotted two five-minute slots with the intention to help him make his case better. Somehow no questions were directed towards the public and towards the points that many of us made in the Planning Commission meeting. Commission tried many ways to move the faulty amendment forward to recommend to the council, but fortunately all proposals failed because of the split votes. Mr. Pierluigi, Commissioner made it clear to us that public's two minutes are only there to make us feel good. Mr. Pierre Luigi explained it through an anecdote. The whole community was again established in the liquor store. He continued, but we put it there. The commission clearly explained why the amendment should and would move forward. San Jose dollar needs and year-end budget. This you scratch my back and I scratch your scenario between Mark Tercini and City never had much room for public best interests. Planning staff and Mark Tessini told us it was okay for the neighbors to have direct sun only after 11 a.m. in the winter season. Planning staff, can you please tell us where do you draw the line? Or perhaps we'll learn when Mark Tessini files the next amendment. We will likely find out, we'll likely find out no direct sun in winters is also okay for us. Ms. Sylvia Commissioner calling Mark Tessini a visionary undermines a long drawn out, not so old urban village plan which was put together keeping the future needs in mind. I encourage Ms. Sylvia, planning staff and commission to be twice as much visionary and put in a planning permit application for twice as a high hotel in their own neighboring lots. Let's ship. Thank you, your time is up. Next speaker. Um, I'd also ask the speakers to say your name so I know um, which cards have spoken. Hi, Mayor. Council. My name is Bill Schaefer. I've been a resident on Hanson Avenue, the next street over from Spar Avenue for the past 25 plus years. I've come tonight to speak in support of the residents on Spar Avenue since these challenges that they're facing are the ones that could have been mine. Uh, the hotel being proposed is an attractive design in an area that sorely needs it. The whole strip begs for attention 
and almost seems designed to coerce us into appreciating anything that would replace what's currently there. Unfortunately, the Olin Hotel is currently proposed has the potential to create many problems beyond its current property boundaries, not the least of which is the precedent it would set for the other adjacent developments down that street behind Spar Avenue in the future. The neighbors in the area worked painstakingly with city planning for the better part of two years to come up with mutually agreed upon height setbacks and daylight planes. My takeaway from last week's planning commission meeting, which I attended, was that high interest rates and high construct construction costs are creating the current need for these general plan changes to quote unquote make their plan work. However, the current market conditions change and interest rates go back down, which they surely will, can we expect that the general plan to be adjusted once again to meet those new conditions? Is the general plan now going to incorporate a sliding scale where building height setbacks and daylight planes are continuously adjusted based on market conditions? Once economic conditions improve, can we anticipate that this hotel, once built, shrinks to conform to the originally agreed to plan? That's certainly not likely. From per perspective, this is a neighborhood that has been in place for 70 years, and these buildings that are being going to be built there will be there 40 to 50 years in the future. Surely we can't be so short-sighted to now throw out the urban village plan that was only established six years ago. Thank you. Next speaker, I'd also like to call down Kim and George Casey. That's got to sink. No, it, I'm sorry. There, there's actually two timers. There's one that they start. I started this one a little late. I just told my staff to make sure we sync up our two timers. Um, so his last go ahead. were not made. And there, there is a, a timer on the podium. My name is Jane Wolf, and I am a resident on Spar Avenue. I respectfully ask the city council to vote no on the resolutions to amend the Santana Rover Valley Fair Urban Village Plan. The planning department has demonstrated no concern for the residents of Spar Avenue and the thousands of others who reside within the Santana Row Valley, Ur Valley Fair Urban Village. Broadly recommending the city council approve all submitted general plan amendments by one developer without considering the impact to residents is egregious and blatantly snubs the collaborative effort between city and community members that went into the creation of this urban village plan, which was approved in 2017. The developer knew the urban village plan requirements when he purchased the 425 South Winchester Boulevard in 2020. While I agree a hotel will generate revenue for the city, these general plan changes are not in the spirit of the urban village plan. These changes do nothing to improve the quality of life for our neighborhood res residents. Rather, they threaten to do the opposite. Understandably, urban village plans may need reevaluation. This forum, however, is not the proper way to address these changes. A formal change process for urban villages that involves affected communities needs to be created and is a better av avenue to adjust changes to urban village plans rather than leaving decision making solely in the hands of staffers and corporate stakeholders. In closing, please. Approval of this plan is reckless and do doing so demonstrates lack of regard for your constituents. This will set precedence for all urban village plans across San Jose. And as a resident, I hope you take the comments of these residents in opposition to heart when you vote. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Um, my name is David Duquette. Um, I guess what bothered me most was at the uh, planning commission meeting was the planning department and the developer uh, kept on bringing up marking conditions, you know, as uh, that's all they could talk about and they had little to talk about how this would adversely affect our neighborhood. I'm personally, I own several uh, commercial properties. Um, I know real estate. Um, it can be a risky business, um, but if you purchase correctly, uh, you can, it can be quite lucrative. Given the marking conditions, this applicant made the gamble when he purchased this property that he could develop it and earn a handsome profit. 
at the end of the day, he paid too much for the property and the market turned on him. This is part of the game. You buy poorly, you're gonna pay dearly. Now the developer is blaming high interest rates and rising costs as the reason he's not able to build right now. And that we need to actually relax the regulations in order to protect his profits while lowering our property values. We should not be the ones to pay for his bad business decisions. In the general plan under VN 1.11, it states, protect residential neighborhoods from encroachment of un incompatible activities and land uses, which may have a negative impact on the residential living environment. The current setbacks in daylight plains were drafted with this provision and many others in mind. This is just one of many general planned uh, provisions that are that are gonna be violated if this goes through. None of these say anything about market conditions or the need for the developer to make a profit. In the current urban village, regulations took years of research and study to complete and- Thank you. Next speaker. Good evening, I'm, my name is Phyllis Weber, and my properties are 390 and 382 Spar, which back up to 425 Winchester Olin Project. In 1986, 390 Spar was zoned professional, but, but has been arbitrarily rezoned by the Urban Planning Commission as residential. At one time, I allowed Mark Tassini to try to make changes to my zoning, pay $17,500, and plan his building 22 feet higher than the established urban village guidelines. I eventually realized this would impact all properties going north and spar and didn't go forward with him. Now Mr. Tercini has developed changes to his and his investors hotel plan which come even closer to my lot lines. In fact, as I understand it, there's a zero setback, which will uh, again increase the shadows on my property. If he gets his way, other developers will want the same change, and all residents going north on Spar will have shadows in their backyards, and their property values will be affected. I respectfully request that the proposed hotel not go forward as planned, but instead be redesigned to conform to the existing planning standards for height and setbacks in order to maintain the integrity and the ambiance of the Santana West neighborhood development. I respectfully ask you to remember that the decisions you make today will infect the entire community and be remembered for generations past you. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. I'd also like to call down Daphna and Scott. Hello, Mr. Mayor and council members. My name is George Casey, 40 plus year resident of San Jose. I'm actually here to speak in support of the project and hope that you do vote yes to approve staff's recommendations. This is a urban village plan. Urban villages were envisioning dense development. This is a dense commercial development. Additionally, it's gonna create jobs and more importantly, in a city that's strapped for revenue at time, from times, it's gonna generate more revenue. So I would ask, despite the difficult decision here before you, that you do support staff's findings and recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Hello, I'm Daphna Wolf. I'm president of the Winchester Neighborhood Association, and I'm a member of the Santana Row Winchester Urban Village Planning Committee. The general plan specifies that the urban village committees will set the guidelines for each urban village. This committee was originally set for six meetings. It became an 18-month, 24-meeting process as neighborhood integration drove studies that were then evaluated. 
the resulting urban village plan is comprehensive and follows the twenty forty general plan let me be clear we're not against a hotel on the site we only ask that they follow the twenty forty general plan and the urban village guidelines it was stated by planning commissioner all of area at the december sixth planning commission meeting that there are always victims whenever anyone builds this was interpreted to mean it doesn't matter who's adversely affected by a project as long as the developer and the city make money. This statement and sentiment does not reflect the 2040 general plan or the urban village plan. And as a homeowner directly behind Santana West, I never felt like a victim during that process. There is a right way to develop with all stakeholders involved. During the urban village committee time, we asked for site by site heights, setbacks, and shadow studies. In fact, this parcel is out of compliance with the plan, even without the general plan amendment. Much has been said about what current market conditions are. Market conditions do change, but shadows, shade, privacy, and traffic do not. The neighbors gave up so much during the urban village planning process. The neighborhood integration with urban villages is hanging in the balance. These heights just cannot be pushed any further as they were pushed past acceptable limits by the planning department during the development of the plan. I wanna leave you with a quote from Mayor Sam Licardo regarding another hotel project. We don't owe developers anything in the city except one thing, clarity. So once the rules are set, it seems to me that if they comply with the rules, they... Thank you. Next speaker, I'd also like to call down Chris. Council, uh, the Wait, three homes right behind the urban village plan. Uh, there's a reason why we moved to this area. You know, we, we worked hard. We, we want to move to an area that we want to live in. We chose this area. Uh, we don't need the area to change, okay? Uh, it's going to greatly affect my privacy because as this, as everyone has said, if this goes through, it will set precedence to pretty much all the development towards that area. I have two kids love the love the sun. I just invested thousands, tens of thousands of dollars on a solar roof going green. I'm already getting, if any building develops right behind my house, it will already decrease two hours of sunlight every day. With this going to happen, it's going to decrease another 50%. So, you know, it's also going to encourage my neighbors not to get solar. It's going to affect the quality of life. It's going to affect, affect our uh, privacy. And hopefully you guys with good conscience will know. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Okay, um, just note, I'm gonna, your, your timer's gonna be on the podium. I'm gonna take down the, po the, the timer on the screen so people can see your presentation. But the, your timer is on the podium. I think I'd rather have the, the timer up there. Well, then the people can't see your, your that's, handout. That's fine, somebody okay. else will show that. Okay. reflect on the fact that there may be victims to this policy change in this room. And that may be an unintended consequence, but a consequence nonetheless. I don't think there should be victims. And that's what planning is all about. Council, what you just heard was a December 6 Planning Commission meeting when Commissioner Cantrell expressed extreme concern about Phyllis Weber and any others who will be negatively impacted by GBT 23001. Commissioner Lardenois admits that there were flaws with this process and Alivario that there will be victims. Do not allow Phyllis Weber to be the victim of this flawed planning process as warned by Commissioner Cantrell. We've had a chance to talk directly with few staffers 
from few offices who may or may not have properly conveyed all of our concerns there will not be enough time since planning commission meeting for us to talk to all offices resulting in a properly informed vote this will impact the entire urban village without them properly being notified it is not equitable that they have been excluded from this notification there was big concern about the proper no proper notification and stakeholder involvement during the deferral discussion at the beginning of this meeting although this although the project itself is not officially being voted on now realistically it is the project will be approved at the director's hearing not count thank you next speaker also hank come on down Just, you know, the timer is visible on the podium. Hello, members of the city council. Uh, Wait, mute. Time. Thank you. You were muted. Start the timer over. Go ahead. Hello, uh, members of city council. I am pro-development. Uh, even after Santana Row nearly burned my house down 20 years ago. But I am here today because of the shortcomings of our planning department, pitting neighborhood versus developer. This environmental review, the amendment, and the process are all deeply flawed. The acoustical analysis of the patio and pool is short on detail. The largest source of the noise pollution, the open air restaurant, is nowhere to be found on the analysis. The traffic studies were performed during off hours, and the developer is still hunting high and low for adequate parking off site. Without these details, the plan and reviews are merely theoretical and incomplete. The amendment is a knee-jerk attempt to solve a 0.6 acre issue by changing an entire 185 acre plan, a product of 18 months of collaboration between the city and concessions made by the community. That sounds bad, but it gets worse. Only the residents within the immediate vicinity of the site were notified. As I look on the map, I counted 198 single family homes with a fence line either inside or uh, adjacent to the plan area. Only 16 of those 198 homes have been notified of these changes. I ask that a formal change process for urban village plans be instituted and that these agenda items be sent back to the planning department. Thank you for your time. Thank you, next speaker. Um, I had call. I have. I've called the four names: Hank, Chris, Kim, and Jane. I also had a Scott. One person didn't say their name. We assumed he was Scott, so there could be a Scott as well. Okay. Hello, my name is Chris. I'm a homeowner that's in the uh, scope of the project. I recently, I, I should say, uh, a couple years ago, worked on a project on Winchester Corridor. It was a uh, formerly reserved apartments. It's now called the Lynn Haven. That's a 647 unit apartment complex. That was the same characteristics of this project backed right up against residential. It was originally had zero lot line, had insufficient parking, had a rooftop pool. And one of the requirements that really set the neighbors up is removal of vegetation along the fence lines. That project, which turned out to be all right, also has the same, uh, same height requirement at 86 feet. Um, that project went ahead and was approved by the city council and it was completed. Now, it's hard to tell me that you can make a 647 unit apartment complex fit within the existing guidelines, but you can't make a hotel that's one fourth the size on the piece of property work. That's hard to believe. The amendments that were made to that plan that had to go back to the the uh, architect four times included all vegetation removed was replaced with mature plants all windows facing westward the properties right behind it were a minimum height of five feet off the ground with non-reflective glass the the shadow lines had to remain at 45 degrees so it did not negatively impact the residents directly behind the project as far as solar or vegetation needs for gardens 
and also required the project to pay for uh, improvements along Winchester Boulevard that was going to deemed a negative impact after another EIR was done for the traffic impact report. A cut and paste report on the original EIR was deemed insufficient. So I ask you guys respectively go back, look at the EIR, starting with the EIR process and really, really look at it hard. How bad is this going to affect the existing residents and neighborhoods around it? Okay, so are Jane, Kim, and Hank still interested in speaking? Okay, so I'm going to move on to the Zoom speakers. Okay. And then after um, this speaker, I'll move back to Zoom. So my name is uh, Hank. I live uh, on SPAR. Uh, I live a little bit farther down from the corner. Um, my worry is if we give in to this requirement, the next person's gonna ask for another 25 feet, the next guy's gonna ask for another 25 feet. Uh, we all know how this works. Uh, they're businessmen, they wanna make money, I understand that. But there is an urban vision, uh, village plan that's been in place, it's been voted on. Why can't they just, you know, build to that plan? Why do we have to change things? If you change this one, I sure hope you're gonna go and change, what, seven other plans, urban village plans? You have to change every single one. So pretty much all I ask from you is vote like this is your backyard. You're supposed to be uh, representative of the people. I'm a person. I don't want this. I don't want them to go above it and just vote like it's your backyard. That's all I ask. Thank you. Okay, Roberta followed by Nick. Hello, Mayor and City Council. My name is Roberta Witte, and I'm a resident of English Estates Neighborhood Association in District 1. I am concerned about two things. Number one, this appears to be a last minute rush, an amendment to the general plan and urban village plan that has not allowed for community input. We citizens, not only the ones that will have to live within the shadow of these towers, but to the rest of us in District 1 that will face similar manipulations by developers deserve to be heard. We voters need to have a place at the table as these projects are developed in order to expand the needed economic base for our city are created and then shoved into our front yards. I'm concerned that this goes to City Council vote at the last agenda item during the last meeting of the year this allowed only three full calendar year days or 30 business hours for the public to try to connect with council members and offices. Not fair to the citizens within District 1. A slippery slope that could allow similar last minute changes that violate the general plan for my neighborhood. Number two, I'm also concerned that this developer is asking to increase height limits, closed setbacks, and even denying homes of their right to sunlight in a last minute push. Not fair. We do, not, we do want development, but the, we want time to, for the community to be heard. Please change the process to protect our citizens. Please vote no. Thank you. Nick, followed by Greg. Good evening. I, I'm going to be pretty straightforward. I am a financial analyst. I understand the city's plans. I understand the development and what the growth means to the city. But realistically, looking at what all of this does to the community, going back to agenda item 8.1, 8.2. You have a tremendous amount of people who cannot realistically, affordably live in this area. And as a city, we want to build infrastructure that is going to grow and give us more tax revenue, right? From property taxes, from 
high-tech workers making millions of dollars in revenue. What do we do with the people that have built the city what it is? What do we do with the teachers, with the people that have actually grown this community to be what it is? I need the city council to take a step back and actually stop thinking about money, revenue, and numbers, and think about what do we do with the people that have been here for the last half a decade, right? Growing this to what it should be, and actually like fight for those people. So this is what I'm asking for from the city council, be our fighters. Greg, followed by Amy. Hello, city council members. Uh, my name is Greg Chisty. I wrote a brief email that is in the letters from the public attachments section of this agenda item, which I hope, hope you have read. I want to make sure the following points are clear to you. I am a young homeowner in the urban residential zoned portion of the Santana Row slash Valley Fair urban village. I am strongly in favor of the proposed text amendments, and I'm strongly in favor of the property owner's plans for the hotel. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Thank you, Amy, followed by Brian. Good evening, Mayor Mahan, Vice Mayor Kamei, and Council Members. I'm Amy Cody, a resident of the Moreland West neighborhood, located in the heart of the Westgate commercial area. I had not closely followed the proposed general plan amendment until recently. Perhaps like others, I thought the main question was whether to allow a seven-story hotel at this particular location. City officials have described the site as sitting, quote, in the shadow of the 120 foot tall Santana West office building. But local residents are understandably concerned that their homes and yards will soon be sitting in the shadow of 85 foot buildings. When I watched the December 6th Planning Commission meeting, I was shocked to learn that the proposed general plan amendment in support of the Olin Hotel project would raise height limits, cut setbacks in half, change the daylight plane and introduce a zero lot line for certain residential properties across the entire Santana Row Valley Fair urban village. How is it that these sweeping changes, which would impact a 185 acre area, are tied to a single project with a public notice requirement of only 1,000 feet? This is all too familiar and we need to do better in our city. What are the anticipated consequences of greater heights dramatically smaller setbacks, changes in daylight planes, and use of zero lot lines throughout the urban village. Will even higher intensity development next to residential property be the new standard for urban villages across our city? Well-considered general plans and urban village plans hold little weight if they're amended to accommodate every bigger, taller, denser project wanted by a developer or the city. Substantial, wide-ranging changes to these plans deserve a broad public process and require thorough analysis. Thank you, Brian, followed by M. Thank you. Um, I was there when uh, there was a park there, mobile home park. You know, there was a bunch of people there. They were really wonderful people. Many of them didn't make it to the process. Imagine not knowing where you're going to live when you're going to die. Having faced that a few times in my life, <laughs> I don't think people really understand. We really wanted to be part of this community. But now, you know, some of us made it, some of us didn't. But there was an agreement with all the grief that went through with this provision. All those meetings and stuff where people had a chance to say, and now now it's being changed. I can tell you, eventually, 
there will be no mobile home parks in Santa, San Jose or Santa Clara or anywhere else. Is this on item 10.3? Just want to remind you to stay on topic, please. All right, I will stay on topic. I'm sorry, um, Your Honor. Actually, I will lie to you, Mayor. I'm sorry about that. Um, I watched the community disintegrate in front of me. Neighbors' houses taken out while I'm sitting there. there there's a price to be paid. I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out why that makes me such a horrible person. It truly does. And trust me, when you're involved in this process, it really does. Thank you. M followed by Paul. Go ahead, M. Okay, M has uh, lowered their hand. Paul, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Paul Cooper from the Horseshoe. I want to thank, thank all of you, every single one of you residents that share this city with me that came out and provided informed, engaged, articulate positions on the corruption that goes on in the planning commission that is chaired by Pierre Luigi Oliverio. Now you know what I deal with. I have been advocating in this city, in that planning commission, and this is my eighth year. Eight years I've been dealing with that planning commission. It used to have only seven members, and four of them, four of those seven, used to all live in Willem and profited from the positions that they took in that planning commission until I pointed that out, now we have 10. So there's a, there's, a certain, there's a certain precedent that has been set within that planning commission that is corrupt, it's disgustingly corrupt. And I can't wait, I cannot wait until the next planning commission so I can bring the quotes that I've heard here, especially this one, you buy poorly, you pay dearly, I love it. That one, I can't wait till public comment in the planning commission so I can bring that to Pierre Luigi Oliverio's face. Now, the positions that the public is taking right now on, on this issue is informed and it is in opposition of what it is the planning commission has, uh, the position they've taken. So I'm very, very interested in hearing what it is that the that the council is going to take. I want to thank uh, uh, my vice mayor, Kameen, for bringing this. Thank you, Elizabeth, followed by M. Hi, I just wanted to voice our concern from living in the neighborhood. Uh, being born and raised in, in this house on Spar Avenue, uh, my family has a couple lots along Spar and Winchester and just wanted to bring our concern about the privacy and the quality of life that <clears throat> is, in, is in jeopardy with this proposed development. Um, it's not just about this one development, it's about safeguarding our community from a domino effect that could <clears throat> compromise our privacy, space, and cherished natural light. Granting this request would not only encroach on our immediate surroundings, but could potentially open the floodgates for similar encroachments by other developments. <clears throat> this development could uh, affect the parking and traffic along our neighborhood and um, the comfort and enjoyment of our own home. So I'd like to you, you all take that in, into consideration when discussing this matter. Thank you. Thank you, M, followed by Michelle. Hello, thank you. In addition to prior comments by the community to deny this proposal, especially David, the commercial property owner's comment, and that of the financial analyst requesting to consider neighbors who have built this community, many of which I know have lived here for decades, not just five years, are the following. The changes for this proposal are way too big and consuming of the lot, bothering neighbors, and setting precedent 
to continue to do so throughout our community without adequate consideration. It seems to be a fly off the hurry and rush this thing through, which doesn't serve anybody since buildings exist for, I live in a home that's 70 something years old. The ramifications live on for quite a while. Um, in addition, the builder said that the basis of this request is failure to attract any funding. Please have the builder, um, the developer, produce those communiques this evening, proving his claim. And above all, deny the request for this um, proposed change. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michelle. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you for hearing me this evening. Um, I am the owner of four parcels, two on Spar and two on Winchester, and have a, a, a very good understanding of development and how it works. However, I want to appreciate all the effort and hard work that was put into um, the urban village um, communications between residents and the city uh, several years ago in coming up with uh, plans that would work for both uh, residents and commercial. So to uh, change the setbacks and the um, sunlight issues, just because we're in a market of difficulty for developers is not fair to all the work that's been put in uh, forth in creating this urban uh, village plan. So I encourage council to oppose the amendments that have been proposed for this plan. Um, again, given that the market vol volatility um, comes and goes, but decisions about uh, changing amendments stay permanent. Thank you. Back to council. Okay. Thank you, Tony. Thank you to Everyone who took the time to come and weigh in, share your perspective with us, definitely helps inform our conversation. I'm gonna to go to the vice mayor first. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of the, the residents, the speakers who came to uh, share uh, your thoughts today and your concerns. And I know I've seen many of you at um, some of the meetings that we've had. And I think that it, it is uh, important to get um, uh, very clear on, on some of the items of, of what it is and what it is not. And I guess I would ask staff to uh, speak to some of these items um, uh, in terms of, uh, it has been brought up in terms of looking at item number um, uh, 10.3 uh, B number four in terms of the no setback and no step, uh, step back. One of the things that I heard you say was that in fact uh, uh, the zero, there, is, there would be a zero lot line. However, that because it would be mixed use that it is a 10 foot rear setback. And then when I looked at the plans that the uh, architect showed there was a 20 foot setback. So it's very, very confusing for the community when we're saying zero and then it's 10 and then it's 20 and then one area it's 47. Um, and I know that um, one of the, the most affected properties which is Phyllis Weber uh, who has the commercial property uh, when she hears zero setback she thinks the building is gonna be right there on the property line, which is not showing in the diagrams that I looked at. So I would like clarification on that. The other thing I want clarification on is when uh, someone mentioned there's gonna be a dom domino effect on encroachment and the existing property that is adjacent to uh, this property is uh, already commercial. Phyllis's property is commercial. Um, it was changed during a uh, sort of like a all uh, um, 
sweep of putting it into residential, but the, since it's grandfathered in, the existing commercial still is there. So the other properties down the line are not. They're all residential. So is it in fact, one of the speakers talked about, oh, well, you know, it's just going to go all the way down. So we need clarification on those. Um, yes, Vice Mayor. So to your first question about the proposed amendment, what we are saying with that language is that um, for that specific, for any sites that are RN residential neighborhood where there is an existing commercial use, legally established commercial use, which in this case of the Urban Village Plan, it is just 390 SPAR, they, they wouldn't, um, figure 5-3 that requires a 20 foot, set, 20 setback, 20 foot setback, it wouldn't apply in that case. And one of the reasons is that right now the way the Urban Village Plan reads is that any, com any commercially designated site, they don't have setbacks and they don't have stepbacks. That's the Urban Village Plan. So when we do our analysis and our review, we start with Urban Village Plan, General Plan or Urban Village Plan, and then we go to the zoning code. The zoning code will also talk about heights, although sometimes the heights really live in an Urban Village Plan. In this case, the setbacks live in um, the mixed-use commercial zoning district. And when you go to the zoning ordinance, you'll see that it has to have a minimum 10-foot setback. So as long as it's 10 feet, they're consist they would be consistent with the zoning code. The applicant has chosen to set the building back 20 feet. That's their prerogative, and I think that works for their design. Yeah. So, so, so I, guess, I guess when you say zero setback, Phyllis thinks that the building is going to come straight right into it, like right next to her, but that's not the case. It cannot, yeah. It would okay. have to be a minimum of 10 feet. Okay. So um, in terms of um, the, the sweeping through the urban village, is this the only site that would have commercial next to it? I'm sorry. Is that because the right? because the other the other properties on Spar are all residential, even though behind them is commercial, right? So this is the only unique property here on this site. Is that correct? You mean 390 Spar? Yes. 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 So all of the other properties are all commercial. They're I mean they're all residential, not commercial. Yes. So that's so what's happening at at the corner is not applicable to anybody else down the line. Because I'm thinking about the domino effect on the other side. That's right? correct. Okay. And then um, in terms of, um, I just wanted clarification on notification area. Did they get the 1,000 foot notification all the way around? Um, yes, so it's uh, pursuant to our council outreach policy because this is a significant project. We yes. have a 1,000 foot radius from okay. 425. Okay. And um, in terms of um, looking at uh, mitigation, uh, you mentioned in the presentation that there were um, several neighborhood concerns. And uh, as part of this, um, one of the things, I guess I'd like to ask the, the, uh, um, the okay. applicant. I think that the community really has some items that are very concerning. Um, they're worried about uh, shade and shadows. Uh, one gentleman mentioned that you know he has solar, and he's definitely, you know, I mean that's a huge investment. Um, a home is a huge investment to begin with, and then you know, and I know that um, it was brought up at one of the community meetings. Um, I wanted to ask you about. Um, you know, any mitigations in regard to that? What have you looked at? I also know that SPAR is very, very all of the people around SPAR are very, very concerned about uh, traffic and, and the, the idea that traffic would get into the neighborhood. Um, and, and I understand that. Um, so, you know, in terms of what would you do to be able to mitigate for those, some of those things? Sure. Vice Mayor, I'd love to uh, answer that question for you. And, and we were very um, <clears throat> fortunate with the environmental review and the traffic study. It indicates that there isn't a concern for SPAR. But I recognize that people have concerns for SPAR Avenue. Recognize that the office building uh, adjacent to our site across um, 
Boland Avenue has not been occupied at this time. So what I'd like to do is suggest a post-traffic analysis that could be done with Kimley Horn, the environmental um, firm that did the uh, report, to do a post-traffic analysis that can actually identify if there's any additional uh, traffic coming measures that can be uh, implemented along Spar or Bolin Avenue. Yeah, uh, I, I think that the traffic is, is a big issue in that entire area. As you right. know, Winchester is busy, Stevens Creek is busy, and you know, cut through traffic is not fun for the residents. So uh, in terms of trying to find a way to mitigate for that, um, and I know that you know, working with planning uh, to come up with a mitigation plan or do an assessment of what can be done in that area so that uh, people don't go into the neighborhood. I can appreciate that comment, and, and, and we're committed to, to do that uh, very study that uh, would be required. To answer your question with respect to the uh, shade and shadow uh, of the uh, adjoining residential units, we're fortunate that the building faces the east and we have completed, and I was hoping that someone would ask a question about shade and shadow. I know the staff addressed it in their staff report, but we even have even more detailed shade and shadow studies that will be uh, provided to uh, staff as we go forward. And it does indicate that uh, we're not providing any additional shadowing of the residential uh, unit that is owned by Phyllis Weber and is occupied by Phyllis's daughter. Um, we understand she enjoys gardening. It's very fortunate that uh, a member of the community mentioned maybe 11 o'clock. I, I, I want to suggest it's uh, about 9 30, 10 o'clock in the morning. And it's only a certain period of time during the um, entire year that that would provide additional. Uh, and, and, in, and in your studies, I don't know if you had a chance to um, take a look at the area where the gentleman has his solar. Is it impacting? It is not. And we can demonstrate that. Demonstrate that to city staff as we I think I think that's going to be important uh, because we definitely don't want to be able to um, impact someone else's you know sort of ability to use their solar panels, especially when they've made an investment on it. Um, I think that it it's uh, it's also um, important that you know I mean I see that the build the building across the way is much taller and does some shading, so we definitely don't want to be covering up anybody else there. Correct, and the, uh, the building was built at 120 feet across Olin, and we have a shadow study that actually demonstrates what that particular impact is today, and we're not increasing uh, the shade or shadow on any of the properties. Yeah, and, and what, I asked for, uh, um, what I asked staff about the zero lot line, um, you are not building your building right next to Phyllis. No, we're not. Okay, no. because I mean, from what I can see, it is in fact um, uh, 20 feet away. That is correct. Okay, all right. And then the, the last thing I know that you mentioned this at, um, I don't know if it was a community meeting, but you understood that the uh, community did want to have access to your community room, and you, you <coughs> voluntarily made that available. Is that is That, that still is my okay? understanding that they, would, uh, they are in need of an area for uh, holding meetings for the for the neighborhood uh, group and we're very fortunate we have a, uh, a meeting space uh, designed on the on the ground floor and I'm committed to allow the uh, neighborhood uh, to use that meeting room on an as needed basis throughout the year thank you um, I guess I'd like to hear what my other colleagues would like to um, ask in terms of any of the questions that the residents came up with Okay, thank you, Vice Mayor. We'll go on to Councilmember Torres. Good, good afternoon. That's actually, there's no questions or comments to the developer. Uh, I just want to say that uh, I'm uh, extremely disappointed that we went out of order for this item. Uh, Calle Willow is just as important as our west side, and us entirely skipping over it is just uh, extremely, extremely disappointed. Renters, our working class, our unhoused folks, you saw some here, our youth have sat for hours in these chambers and it's how democracy works and I'm just gonna leave it at that. 
and I'm waiting for item 10.2, so thank you. Okay. I mean, I will just note, council members are welcome to request that we change the order. I can take items out of order, given that we have well over a dozen neighbors who have been sitting here for five or six hours. I thought the vice mayor's request was appropriate. I don't see anyone else waiting here for the Kai Willow item, but um, council members are certainly welcome to request that I take an item out of order if they have a number of constituents who are sitting and waiting for hours. I get that. Um, Just my two cents, can, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's get back to the item at hand. Uh, I don't see other hands. Vice Mayor, do you have more on that? I, I had a few questions myself, but I don't see anything from other colleagues. Okay. So just on traffic, maybe I'll go to, um, I, I want to try to understand the, just the impacts, any mitigation that may be done, and then this issue of precedent that I heard brought up. I'm not as deep into the, into the details on this one as the vice mayor, obviously, but on traffic, what does the study estimate, what, what is staff's estimate of the impact on traffic for the neighbors? I heard it, but the staff presentation was fairly quick, and I just want to make sure I understand. Good evening, Mayor um, and Mayor City Council, David Keon. I am Principal Plan of the City's Environmental Review Team. I will want to mention that there are actually, there's a transportation analysis, but there's also the local transportation analysis. Under the California Environmental Quality Act, this project was evaluated per our transportation analysis policy, 5-1, which uses the vehicle miles travel metric. That is essentially how much distance drivers to the site are using to get to the site. So it's essentially a metric to also evaluate greenhouse gas emissions. Um, that impact did not have a significant impact to the vehicle miles traveled. Um, so there's no transportation impact for CEQA. However, there was a local transportation analysis that didn't look at local operations. It didn't look at circulation. It looked at um, just essentially operations, how the site is accessed. We do have Manjeet um, Banway um, from Department of Public Works. Um, she may be able to add some more information on that. But I yeah, just want to mention that for CEQA, there is no transportation impacts and no mitigation measures required. Um, however, there are there is the local transportation analysis, which does go into detail about how um, the circulation will interface in the neighborhood. Okay, and then maybe for the applicant, uh, what if anything are we doing to encourage folks coming out of the property? And again, I may have missed this in the layout, but to not cut through the neighborhood. How are we, what are we doing to encourage them to get out to Winchester the other way? Correct, the, the driveway leading out to Olin Avenue, we're uh, proposing to install uh, left turn only at that driveway entrance or exit, excuse me, uh, to a signalized intersection at Winchester and Olin. So there isn't any reason for anyone to want to cut through because they get easily onto southbound Winchester Boulevard or northbound Winchester Boulevard. So we're looking to uh, put that sign signage in and we can work with Public Works if there's anything else that can be done to discourage uh, traffic from making a right onto Spar Avenue. Okay, thank you. So you're 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 willing to put in a turn, a sign that requires people to go left out of the parking. That is correct. Okay. Um, and then I just want to clarify Vice Mayor's question. So post traffic analysis. So after built, we would then you would fund an analysis of traffic impacts, is that what I heard, to un identify if that's working, essentially? That is correct. Uh, I believe there's been um, a number of traffic calming measures that have already been implemented on SPAR and coming in off of uh, Stevens Creek Boulevard. I think there's some question from the community whether or not they like those traffic calming measures, or they don't. But what I'm proposing is to provide a, an analysis that will help Public Works and Department of Transportation to figure out the best uh, uh, means and methods to uh, to address that. Okay. And would that analysis help us understand how many vehicles are cutting through the that, neighborhood? That is correct. Right. Okay. I think that will that would be an important thing for the neighbors, for the community to be able to understand and weigh in on. On the, on the shade issue, 
I, you know, I, I thought the, the figure that was up on the screen a moment ago was helpful. Um, you, you mentioned you have more analysis, but we don't have it this evening. I'm just we curious. We do have can it you, this you, evening. You haven't asked for it. I have uh, Jung's son who was that bring your, it up. Was that what, what was on the screen earlier? Was that from you all? Or could, no, could you tell that, us a little more that was about a, what? That's part of the staff report. It I was see. not part of our uh, okay. presentation. I have kind of two parts on this. One, one maybe for you all, if you would share what your analysis shows. And then I'd like to ask about this precedent issue of what else happens um, as we go from commercial to residential along that strip there. Just make sure we understand yeah, any implications. Mr. Mayor, uh, if you would like, uh, Jung is available here to explain exactly the, the slide that we sure. have. Sure, yeah, I'm curious to just hear what. Thank you. Sorry, we didn't get a chance to go over this earlier. But we basically did the shadow for the four solstices, the June, March, September, and December. Obviously, we can't do every day of the year, but those are basically the four seasons. So if you look at June right now, from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., there is no impact on any of the residential at all. If you look at March and September, at 9 a.m., you see a little bit of impact on the residential. From 9.30 on, there is no impact of shadows on any of the residential. Now, December is the worst case scenario. That's when the sun is the lowest, so you're gonna have the most shadows in that area. So from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., you will have a little bit of shadow on the residences. You can see there at 9 a.m. there. So from 11 a.m. on, there is no impact of shadows on the residences. And then the red line, the dotted red line, shows the impact, the current impact of the shadow from the office building that is directly south. So you can see that in December at 11 a.m., the office building is creating the shadows for the residences, but not necessarily the, the, the hotel. I see. Okay. Okay. Okay, that's helpful. And then just to clarify this point, of, thank you for that. Okay. This precedent of the next parcel over and the one after that, what, when it comes to uh, the setbacks, as was described, I heard that it was different between commercial and residential. Can you just clarify what happens with potential future development and the next site and the one after that? So I heard that as a major concern of the neighbors. So looking at the parcels that are residential neighborhood along Spar Avenue, they, they, they're adjacent to mixed use commercial um, designated sites. And if we move forward with the proposed amendment, then the setback would go from 40 feet to 20 feet for all of those sites, except for the one at the corner, 390 Spar which is residential neighborhood, but it has an existing commercial use, and it has had a, a commercial use since, I think, 1984, 1985. So therefore it's smaller? Is that uh, and that one, yeah, it would be 10 feet. Okay, but for the, others, the other parcels, it would actually be a larger required setback, minimum than, setback. Than what is in the zoning code. It would be 20 feet. Right now it's 40 feet, but we're suggesting 20 feet. Okay, um, let, me, let me go back, let me go over to Council Member Cohen, see what questions he has. Well, my first question I think was just answered, but I was trying to understand if this, this general plan amendment is not just for this property, it's for all the properties then along this row because there's a, there's a reduction in the setback on all properties uh, as part of this general plan amendment, is that correct? So it's a general plan, am text amendment of the urban village plan but it would impact those properties and it but is it specifically for this urban village or for all urban village properties? this urban village this urban village um, and then the other question I have is uh, this this Jeep general plan amendment is not specifically then tied to the fact that the use on this property was changing from residential to the hotel it was a, it was more of a general uh, an amendment needed in order to make all the sites more viable for development is that the purpose so it's a privately initiated general plan amendment. So the applicant came in um, after um, developing their design for the hotel project and determining that the way the plan is set up, it doesn't facilitate it. So they would need these setback changes. However, looking at the sites, the mixed use commercial sites along Winchester, they're very narrow and a 40 foot setback would essentially, I, I think like more than, or maybe about half of the site would, you know, they wouldn't be able to use it. So. In our analysis, we determined a 40-foot setback for all of those sites 
um, doesn't allow for the flexibility for commercial uses to actually take advantage of the site. So that's why we're recommending. So as part reduced. of based on the initiation of this work, you did an analysis of what would be what should be better for development on all the sites. Yes, my understanding. Okay. Mixed use commercial. And then I heard some discussion of the traffic study. So there was a th this. Th what's important here is the difference between this use and what was already an what was previously anticipated for the site, right? In terms of this traffic study, the initial proposal was for how large of a residential um, site development? Mark would have to answer that question. Council Member Cohen, the original project was five stories, 27 residential units, but 12,000 square feet of commercial. So 8,000 on the ground floor and another 4,000 on the second floor of the building. And then this is for the hotel has more rooms than the residential would have had in terms of units. But I guess the, the incremental difference in the amount of vehicle traffic is the question, I guess, that I'm asking. I don't know. It, because I think there was concern about traffic pass through. But the, that, that, if there's traffic that's going to go through the neighborhood, that would have occurred, in theory, could have occurred with the original use design there as that, well. Right? That is correct. And, and similar to when the uh, service station was an, uh, a viable uh, service station. So if it was rebuilt as a service station, people could go any direction they'd like to go. Right, OK. OK, I think that's all my questions for now. Thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Khmer? Okay, so you know what happens when you ask questions, when other people ask questions, then more questions come up? Okay, so uh, the, the one question regarding the, um, the modification to the setback for new development when it's adjacent to residential going from 40 feet to 20 feet, then that would include everything else down the line. I thought we weren't going in that direction. Would it also include any adjacent uh, residential throughout the urban village? Yeah, so there's, there's two proposed changes here. There's one that's site-specific to the Winchester Hotel. That's an increase in the height. All of the other changes, which about the step down and the setback, are in what's called figure three, which applies to all um, commercial or mixed-use commercial development adjacent to residential neighborhood land use designation. So it's not just the residential neighborhood properties next to this hotel, it's other properties in the urban village, for example, along Winchester Boulevard and those that back up on the properties in Stevens Creek, for example. So, so when the urban village was created, this wasn't thought of? It was thought of. I think staff at the, the staff at the time is through the process. We came to a compromise. There was I think some thoughts at the time by staff that those would create constraints for development, but that was what was agreed upon through the process and would council approved at that time. To not change it? or Because right now you're saying that the designation's from 40 feet, so currently it's at 40 feet. Correct. Right? So when the urban village plan was passed, it was 40 feet. Correct. Okay. And you're changing it now because you don't think it's a good idea. No, we're changing it now. So we're, we're, we're recommending a change to the setback from 40 to 20 in this circumstance, which is larger than the, spite, the specific site, because we recognize that there is a constraint. It creates a constraint for development on much of the mixed-use commercial property. I see, I see. Well, in this case... It makes case, it difficult to achieve a sort of vision of, of building more urban commercial on, on, these, on Winchester primarily. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that one of the things about having it 40 feet away is that the residents don't want it that close. So I think that um, if we remove this out of, the, out of this uh, uh, staff recommendation, it's because I think the, the site specific is really for the, for, the, um, for the hotel, right? And everything along the way, if it were to remain at 40, it's uh, it's what the urban village plan states, right? Correct. Okay. So I am going to move this, but I'm going to remove the item number two, which states 
amend figure 5.3, new development adjacent to residential neighborhood land use designation um, uh, to modify the setback for new development when adjacent to residential and urban residential land use designation from 40 to 20 so that it remains as is in the, in the urban village plan. So I'm taking that out. You can do that, but I think one clarification, are you saying that it's completely removed or it's the, the proposed amendment would still apply to um, the proposed hotel site? So for the hotel, the setback would be reduced to 20 or would the setback remain 40? Well, I'm removing it for, because one of the things that, that was brought up was this whole domino effect and the effect to the rest of the properties and the residential area. Right? So we want to leave that as is for those areas, right? And we know that the corner is next to commercial, right? Um, and so uh, to me, it's different being next to residential, right? So I'd, I'd like to keep that separate. Does that make sense? Well, Let's, so so the, the corner property is adjacent to both existing commercial and existing single family. So I just, are you saying that the setback, in other words, is the general plan amendments that are being considered tonight um, only specifically related changes that are being made for adjacent to the hotel yes. property? Yes. So therefore, um, the setback on the commercial property would affect, would go down to zero in the urban village plan, but would still be 10 feet in the zoning code. And then for the two houses next to the hotel, which are north of the commercial office owned by Phyllis, this setback would be 20 feet. Or are you saying would it be 40? The, the, the one that's beyond the commercial, I mean, the beyond the hotel, down the line to um, to um, Stevens Creek. Okay, so for the three properties directly adjacent, I think there's three, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I was gonna ask if you can put Sass presentation. Four, 401 South Winchester is the next property up the line. And if you can go to slide four. So for, I think it's the three properties adj ad directly adjacent to the um, proposed hotel site, the setbacks would be reduced from 40 feet to 20 feet for the two single family houses and for the uh, existing office uh, at the corner of Spar and Owen would be zero feet in the plan and 10 feet in the zoning code. Is just want to, just asking a clarifying question. You mentioned three, I, I only see two. Maybe there's only two, I'm sorry. There's only two. I think it was a piece of a third though. Can you, is there another image you could put up? It's actually three properties. It's one, the hotel and two houses. The first image is actually pretty good in the side there. At least a portion of the third house yeah. property. If you go to the third slide, it's pretty clear. Yeah. Go a little farther up. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. It's clear on the other slide, the previous slide. That one. So what you're saying is, so just to be clear. So I see, I yeah, see, yeah, I didn't see that yeah. corner. So it wouldn't be the, it would be for the portion of the hotel site adjacent to those three properties, the setback would um, be 20 feet. 20 and feet. in the rest of the prop residential properties to the north, it would remain 40. In other words, the proposed text amendments, I think what you're, I'm just trying to get a clarification from you. The proposed text amendments we have are both specific in terms of height to the hotel site and the other ones are more broadly proposed. What you're saying is do not more broadly propose them, just limit them to the three properties that are adjacent to this hotel site. And, they, and the proposed amendments would not apply to the other residential neighborhood sites that aren't adjacent to this hotel. Yes. And then the other thing that um, the mayor brought up with the traffic study in terms of analysis, I'm, I'm not just interested in analysis, I'm interested in implementation because, you know, I mean, it's, 
if we find out that we need to, for example, close off SPAR or do any work there or you know, change things around, right? Um, I would assume that it would be because of the hotel. So, um, you know, in terms of analysis is great, implementation of mitigation is better. So is that, is that something that you, um, uh, I mean, I, we, at this point, I don't know what that is, but I mean, once you have the analysis, you gotta do something with it. I, I understand the yeah. question, and, 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 uh, and I'm receptive to not only doing the analysis, but the work that would be necessary to make whatever adjustment is needed, either on SPAR or Olin Avenue. Kimberly Horn specializes in traffic analysis. They have a whole division, so they would be the ones to turn to to then say, this is what's being caused by the hotel. Right. Okay, it's really difficult to be able to, you know, determine other properties, but for the hotel impact, yes, I'm very comfortable with that. Yeah, because I think that is not sufficient just to have a left-hand turn saying go left, because I think that there are people who will want to go right and, you know, kind of find their way uh, in another direction towards Stevens Creek. So I just want to make sure that that area, especially on SPAR, really gets looked at and something happens for implementation. Sure. I appreciate that. Thank you. And, and Vice Mayor, we do have Manjeet on wait from Public Works on the line. Um, she's on the Zoom. I'm sure you viewed the transportation report. She so could go into the local transportation analysis and improvements. Okay. So, I just wanted to make sure that the, the applicant was willing to uh, implement some of whatever that comes up because I think that it's not enough to just have analysis that you really do need to have implementation. Um, I'll second. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. We have a motion and a second and I don't see any further hands. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Torres? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? Yes. Duan? Yes. Candelas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Batra? Yes. Kenny? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Motion passes. Okay. Thank you. So. Okay, we're going to continue on. Uh, Councilor Torres, uh, if you have folks waiting, we can take 10 2 now if you want to take that first. No? Okay. There's no one waiting for that item? Okay, then we'll go back to land use consent. We'll go back to the order we were in. Let's go to item. We, we still had 10.1A and one. We only passed 10.1C, so we need to take up. A and B, they're both on land use consent. Do we have a motion? A move approval. Second. Thank you. Do we have public comment on land use consent? Paul followed by Brian. Okay, moving on, Brian followed by M. And I want to remind people that this is just land use consent items A and B. Yeah, it's just land use. Thank you. I just wish the uh, city council would have more robust discussions along land use consent. Thank you, ma'am. M followed by Nick. Thank you. If this is, is this pertaining to Doyle and Lawrence Expressway? Yes. Um, I recommend that you deny the change from single family residence to light industrial or commercial because there are two, that area is already too congested and there are two um, elementary schools within walking distance um, on top of it, there's a lot of hyper development that's already been imp approved and then going to impact that Doyle Lawrence Expressway area tremendously. 
and it's just too much. People bought those places for the schools and all the um, things that support raising a family, and I'd like those uh, valuable aspects of the area to be retained. And I feel really strongly about this. Thank you. Nick, followed by Paul. Honorable Mayor Mahan and City Council, I'd like to get your feedback on mobile home usage and where you're zoning that. I, I know we've been trying to get general land use zoned over to mobile home usage, but I, I the don't, reality is there's the oh, loophole. I'm sorry, I don't, I believe that's a different item. I, is that 10.1C, I think he's talking about? So we've already, 10.1C uh, oh, has yeah. already we, been discussed. We discussed and voted on 10.1C earlier. My apologies. No, Continue on. Thank no, you. No problem. Thank you. Paul? Uh, yes, thank you for circling back, Tony. Um, also from the Horseshoe, with, uh, with respect to land use on the west side, which specifically the Lawrence Expressway area, is that the land... When you start making these decisions to rezone, it's only to suit the needs and purposes of ballots that are in direct communication with city staff members. I mean, this is just a fact. It's, it's, it's okay to admit that. It's okay to acknowledge that as a fact, that the developers have direct access to them and they are informing them of what it is that they need in order for these areas to become viable and profitable for the developer. Personally, I don't care about a developer. I don't care about a billionaire and making a billionaire richer. I don't care about maximizing the profits of some stranger that comes to my city that my parents' labor was exploited in order to build the agricultural economy that led to the tech economy so that they can maximize profits. And so the land itself is, is, has not been properly um, acknowledged as a resource that belongs to the entire community. And I resent the fact that these developers got their eye ball and the open ears of city staff members and leverage their influence with them in order to bring these proposals to this council back to council okay back to council there's a motion to approve the two remaining land use consent items which are 10.1 a 10.1 B do we have any further questions or comments councilor Jimenez no? no. Okay. Sorry. Um, then we're ready to vote. Jimenez? Yes. Torres? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? Yes. Duan? Yes. Candelas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Batra? Yes. Kame? Yes. Mahan? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We are on to item 10.2 which is the city initiated general plan amendment pertaining to parcels within and adjacent to the Willow Street neighborhood business district. We have a short staff presentation. Yes, short. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> um, so let's see, here we go. Just some background on um, this proposal. So the last general plan four year review included a work item to explore policies to allow additional housing capacity in neighborhood business districts, including Willow Street NBD. Um, throughout that work, um, we determined and in, in, in communication with the local community, um, there was some overwhelming concerns expressed regarding gentrification and displacement, specifically um, of small businesses in that area. Um, additionally, the results of a poll conducted at the meeting identified that the majority of attendees preferred limiting residential densities 
to 35 dwelling units per acre and a 35 foot maximum building height. On December 7, 2021, City Council approved the following, no change to residential capacity within the Willow Street NBD and direction to staff to change the land use designation on appropriate parcels in Willow Street from mixed use commercial to neighborhood community commercial to reduce small business displacement risk. Staff has also included some additional land use changes within, the within and adjacent to the NBD to better match existing uses and address the stated desired land use form of the community. So we have in the project area 56 properties. Most of them are within the neighborhood business district. Uh, there are five that are just adjacent and outside. The current general plan land use designation is mixed use commercial for all of these properties as shown in sort of that, um, I don't know, peach orange color. Um, this allows for a mostly commercial a project, but it does allow for mixed use um, multifamily, um, I'm sorry, residential uses. So what we are proposing is um, changing those and only these, so the majority of them, 35 parcels, to neighborhood community commercial, which we think will help uh, limit the potential displacement of the businesses due to uh, interest in, in housing on the site. Let's see. We, in our analysis, we also determined that there were 17 parcels that uh, we think mixed use neighborhood is a more appropriate designation. Um, these are for sites that are currently um, on Willow Street and they're being used as single family or multifamily and they're adjacent to multifamily or commercial uses. There are also two parcels that we're recommending to change to residential neighborhood. Again, these are um, existing residential, single family residential. And then lastly, two parcels to change to open space parkland and habitat. These are adjacent to um, 87 and the Guadalupe River um, on the end of the, the, MB, the MBD. So along with these general plan changes, we're proposing zoning changes for 30 parcels that do not have conforming zoning districts. And again, they would conform to the general plans that I discussed in the previous slides. And that is staff's recommendation. Okay, thank you. Let's go to public comment first. Brian, followed by Paul. I hope I'm within the province of mayor. I, I actually I can ask him there because he knows, he knows so much more than I do. I know you know, Mayor, you're, you're an amazing person. Thank you. Um, sometimes I need a good kick in the pants. Um, I think this is really a good concept. You're trying to get people to get a grief. You know, when you watch your, where you live in a mobile home um, and it changes, is scary, but general plan amendments, it's what drives cities. And I hope, um, I just want to see the city find some peace. Um, now I know it sounds silly. Um, this is a fairly good, well thought out plan. Thank you, have a good day. Paul? Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. As a legitimate historian that chronicles and puts into the public domain the legitimate history of the farm workers movement, the lowrider movement, and the Chicano movement, I have legitimately brought to the Historical Landmarks Commission and had acknowledged as a historical landmark dress up three Willow Street that stood as the first headquarters for Lowrider Magazine after interviews with the Madrid family and research that I conducted out of the Green Library at Stanford University. Secondly, Sacred Heart Church is now acknowledged as a historical landmark because of the Chicano priest organization that was founded by Father Anthony Soto and, was, and the president was Father Jim McEntee, whom we have named the county building after. That is how legitimate Jim McEntee was, and he was the president of the Chicano Priest Organization that was founded at Sacred Heart Church by Father Anthony Soto. So there is no one in this city 
that has established the legitimacy of the history of Willow Street and its relationship to the Chicano movement and the foundation of the lowrider movement that was marketed to the world out of 325 Willow Street. With that said, I'm asking the city of San Jose, leave Gaia Willow alone. Councilman Torres, what I'm demanding of you, I'm not asking, I'm demanding of you some banners that show some respect for the pride that we have in Calle Willow. Those banners are faded, oh boy. You've been in office for a year. You've been lagging, bro. We need to start having some pride and some dignity. In back to council. Okay, we are back to council. Thank you, Councilmember Torres. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you to Ruth and uh, planning. I know it's a super long meeting, so I'm gonna, my comments are, are super short. Uh, and I just, I, I wanna extend my, my gratitude to the dedicated community members whose effort have brought us to this pivotal, pivotal moment. It is because of their commitment that we find ourselves here today. Your voices have not gone unnoticed. They, had, they have instigated tangible policy changes within our city. Additionally, I would like to express my appreciation to former council member Perales for pushing this forward and setting the wheels in motion for this vital policy change. Calle Willow holds a special place in my heart and in the hearts of many Washingtoneros. It's where our parents got married or shopped for groceries or shopped for back to school items when there was no target because there was no targets back then. It's where we enjoyed ice cream, where we enjoyed tacos, where we celebrated our culture. This, this district is not just a collection of businesses, it's a cultural haven that, al that allows us to be our true selves. It's a piece of home. The significance of this memo lies in the insurance that th these businesses, firmly rooted in our neighborhoods, are free from displacement. And I take pride that we have restarted the Calle Willow Business District after almost 20 years of being defunct. Preserving our cultural business districts is critical to maintaining the diversity that defines San Jose and ensuring it means, and ensuring it remains a city we all cherish. And that is why I was a little bit disappointed that we skipped over the item. I'm over it now. But I grew up in this business district and I moved to accept item 10.2. Okay, thank you, Council Member. Council Member Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. I also thank uh, my colleague, Council Member Torres, for um, his well said words. Um, as, as the Council Member mentioned, uh, Calle Willow is a corridor of culture and history that um, is long standing here uh, in the city of San Jose. It was home to many activists. Um, still activists to this day, uh, many cannery workers who, um, who, who moved to San Jose for a better life. Um, and of course, home to Sacred Heart Church was a heart of organizing. Um, that's actually where I met Councilmember Torres as he was an organizer there. And um, you know, I just want to thank him for advocating for his community because um, you know, Omar started organizing as, as a 14 year old uh, in the Washington neighborhood. You know, he didn't just come around 10 years ago uh, to start advocating for that neighborhood. Um, so I just, I just want to make sure people know that Omar's not a Johnny come lately and you can't lecture him on what it is to be a Washington Nero. Thank you. All right. Thanks for those comments. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Torres? Heck yes. Cohen? <laughs> Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? Yes. Dwan? Yes. Candelas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Batra? Yes. Kame? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Thank you. Okay, we are on, thank you to staff. We are on to open forum, which is an opportunity for members of the public to comment on items that were not on today's agenda, but pertain to city business. I have, um, I can't, it looks like, Janone, Seraphin, and Chris. Um, whoever gets to the microphone first, um, you can speak. Chris? Are you reading that? Uh, 
I'm gonna make it short and simple um, because the year is about to end. Uh, I know you want me to vo uh, voice down. If we could turn um, down the mic just a little, thank you. Yeah, I know you want me to voice down, um, but this message is directly to you. Um, my name is Jeff Director, 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 director yes, to, to the whole council, thank you. you. Um, I know as a, as a Harvard grad yourself, an undergrad, um, I have sent you a lot of emails during September um, that I'm pretty sure nobody on your staff uh, gave to you. So basically, I was a homeless student uh, at the Bill Wilson Center. Okay. However, I feel like I'm a unique student. I've done a lot of research. I reached out to you several times, gave you copies of publications that I gave already, and just listening to all these stories here make me realize you're shaking your head like that. You shake your head when the lady said that she was homeless. But the thing is, is that my dream school is Stanford University. I feel like I have everything that I need to go there, but I don't have the support system. I'm the only person here. I've been here since one o'clock. I've been doing my work right there in the corner. And the thing is, all you're gonna do, you're gonna shake your head, you're not even gonna follow up with that email, even though I gave you all, that fa all those facts. However, all those developers somehow get to be able to reach you guys, and it's not fair, because that's just the way it is. So please don't tell me you care about the homeless youth or anything like that. I went to the San Jose City College event that you had. You said how many youth was there. I was sitting in the back, I raised my hand. I went to a lot of these meetings virtually. I, ha I have finals going tomorrow, and I have to work all night tonight. And the thing is, nobody's gonna care about that when, when, I, when I try to do my transfer application. So I'm gonna give you a card. I wanna see if you actually talk to me for five to 10 minutes. If any of you try to do that, just speak with me. I'm done. Thank you, I have Chris, um, Raza, and David. And just a reminder, this is for items that were not on the agenda. Um, if the item was already discussed on the agenda, um, that's not the time for this. Uh, I just want to say how disgusted I am with us, with the process in general. I, I'm, I can't believe how ill-informed all you are. Uh, Rosemary, do you read a single email? You're in our district. You're in sir, our district. You could, I'm when sorry, I wanna, you got to direct your comments up, to the council. I want to bring well. any future thing up. Can I trust any of you, any of you, to actually listen to what I have to say? I don't think I, I, don't think I can. I can't trust that. You guys are going to do whatever you want to do, whatever project it is. If you want to push it, you're going to push it, and that's it. I have lost all faith in our government. You had all these people from not my the one up to all these different things. Did you say no to anything? You, it was, you made your mind up before this even started. Why do you waste all of our time? Why do you waste it? I spent the last three months going over all this stuff. And I don't think you read one email. Something's broken here. All of you. I'm just so fed up with this whole system, and I, I've never been more discouraged, ever. You've wasted all of our time. I could have been home with my family. It, I never should have even been here. What representa representation do any of us have this much? Next speaker. I just have to say how disappointed I am in all of you. Um, extremely disappointed. Uh, you have lost all the neighborhood votes. I didn't have a chance to say my name uh, earlier. My name is Chris Gian Greco. I'm the vice president of the Winchester Orchard Neighborhood Association. Many of you, the older ones on the council, have seen us many times. I see Deb Davis smiling, uh, Mr. Cohen, Mr. Jimenez. Many of you have dealt with us in the past. We're a highly informed neighborhood. We're very activated. I appreciate that you asked at least a few questions on, on the issue. Mr. Candelis, it looked like you were leaning that way, but to reiterate how upset and uh, discouraging this vote was, it can't be overstated. It looked completely like what we had been told that the mayor and everybody else on council would follow the vote of whoever's district it is and I can't believe that any of you were really fully informed on this issue with the hotel project. Had any of you taken any amount of time 
to really look at the planning commission which the planning planning commission itself said the process was highly flawed you folks allowed a highly flawed process to be approved and what that told the residents is that small business doesn't matter residents rights don't matter property rights don't matter the urban village plans don't matter and so many other things but I'd like to end the end your year with saying why should I expect anything more from my city that allows to be remain documented the codification in the in the codification of the violation of our constitutional rights through the gun harm reduction ordinance. Thank you, Brian, followed by Paul. The gentleman just spoke, they have power, they have money, and that always, and I do mean always, takes precedent. Every time, always, and in every situation, money takes precedent, and it always does. Gravity, the gravity that helps us stay on this planet and circles around this solar, solar system. Money takes precedent. It always does. And that's what they have to deal with. I, I happen to believe that the, the people in the city council are not perfect, but they're above the, the corruption that we think they are. I don't think they're like that. But I lost my home in San Jose. I have followed this situation for decades. I was rebuked by the um, mayor, rightfully so, when I brought it up. It hurts. It hurts daily. And, and it rips my soul apart. And it rips other people's apart, too. But I only can talk about me. It rips my soul apart. And thank you. Paul followed by Blair. Yes, Paul Soto from Horseshoe. You not have a more prolific, more accomplished historian and advocate in the city that speaks on three primary issues that set a precedent worldwide in the 20th century. Out of one square mile of South si Puedes came the farm workers movement, the Chicano movement, and the lowrider movement that set precedents and acknowledgments worldwide. We gave the world Cesar Chavez. We gave the world Father Anthony Soto. We gave the world Guadalupe Church, whom Robert F. Kennedy was the only church that Robert F. Kennedy acknowledged when he visited San Jose in March of 1968, when he visited this city. Where did he go? He didn't go to, he didn't go to uh, Mission Santa Clara. He didn't go to St. Joseph's Cathedral. He wanted to go where the power was, where the people are. And it was Father Anthony Soto that received him. And I have a picture of that event. With that said, there's a big difference between somebody that identifies as a Mexican immigrant and somebody that identifies as a Chicano. I am a Chicano. And what I'm going to be doing next, just so that you're informed, tell your park will become a historical landmark acknowledged by the County of Santa Clara. Why? Because the first six issues of Lowrider Magazine, I have photographic history and evidence that it was shot there at that park by Theo Morales and Sunny Madrid, right there at that park. And I'm not only gonna have it acknowledged as a historical landmark because of the Chicano and Lowrider movements, but I'm also gonna have a wall built there and a mural to memorialize that historia. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Happy December. Um, thanks a lot for allowing two minutes of public comment at this time. Um, as national security issues at the local level in this country need to be considered at this time with the current events in Israel, Gaza, and the Middle East, 
It is thankful and hopeful that local U.S. communities now and into 2024 can also continue to consider at this time better ideals and good practices that can include ideas of reimagine, health and human services, and good tech accountability. For San Jose, the SFA area, and local U.S. communities to want to continue to work towards open democracy, accountability, and our better human ideals at this time and over the next few months, this can work collectively for this country to continue to work towards the ideas of positive sustainability and peace before war and good ways for the U.S. and its local communities to help stay out of the secrecy, opacity, and duplicity of a wartime democracy and a war economy. We are tired of war in this country. I think we want to work towards peace. I hope local cities in the U.S. can continue into 2024 openness and accountability and to continue to work towards ideas of peace before war. I think the, these good practices and good efforts at the local U.S. level into 2024 can give good examples and best practices to all sides in Israel at this time as well, and that I think will be much needed and much respected. Uh, I hope uh, we are at a time all sides can want to work uh, more towards negotiation and dialogue instead of war, violence, and harm as how to uh, decide the future of Gaza and the human rights of all people now living in Israel. Uh, we have some national security issues to consider at this time in this country. Hopefully I can continue to ask about open, accountable, good tech accountability practices into 2024. Happy holidays to everyone and uh, thanks a lot for the meeting tonight. Nick? Honorable Mayor Mahan, City Council, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much for this tonight. I think growing up in this city, I, I've been here since I was six years old. I'm an immigrant. My family came here. We meshed with what the United States was about and what San Jose was as a city. The only high-tech company here when I was growing up was IBM, down in South San Jose, Cottle. Looking at everything that has been built around us, we, we are a phenomenal city. And for me to, to see the homelessness and some of the things we talked about tonight, about millions of dollars being spent on trying to get people you know, to have some type of housing and some type of, it, it, it is really, really emotionally sad for me. And I know it's hard. I, I'm i not sitting here thinking from your standpoint, this is an easy thing to accomplish. I know it requires money, but I feel as a citizen, we need to stand up and say, we are San Jose. And for all these contractors to be able to go out and do these things for our homelessness, our elders, what we need to do for this city, I have a great sense of pride. And I am looking to you as a city council and as a mayor to kind of feel that same way, where we are not gonna just sit here and take whatever we're given, we're going to fight and we're going to make it happen. I appreciate everything you do. Thank you. Back to the council. All right. Happy holidays, everyone. We're adjourned. Thank you.